I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. I'll be uh, leading this off with our reelected president of the school board. So if you'd all pre uh, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You hear me now? All right, uh, so we have the election of officers is the first thing we have uh, on the agenda. Uh, the procedure for election of officers is uh, on the screen in front of you. I would say on my screen, but I have a blue screen right now. Uh, so uh, the first thing that will happen is you have ballots um, that are for round one, and these are nominating ballots for the president. And then as soon as the president is elected by the board, then I'll be turning over the ranks to uh, whomever the, the president is. But essentially what happens, the reason this is a little bit different than what we've done in the past is we have written ballots for nominations. And typically in the past, we've just done voice nominations. So what will happen is at this point, you would, you would write down on the ballot that you have in front of you who you would like to nominate for president. If you do not want to nominate anyone for president, uh, then you can write abstain on there as well. What will happen is the top two individuals or potentially one individual, if, if it's a top two, those two names will be read by Tim Miner, and he will collect the cards, and then the board then will vote by a second ballot of who to fill that role. If there is only one name or all seven board members put the same name down for any one of these election elected positions, then uh, Tim Miner will let you know that it's been a unanimous nomination of whomever it may be, and then what you're able to do is you're able to second that nomination and do a voice vote at that point to nominate or to, to then call for that person to, to take that elective office. So we won't need the second written ballot. Any questions about the procedures before we get going? Well, in the event of a, of a tie. Okay. So in the event of a tie, so what happens is the two highest vote getters always uh, are our two highest nominees. Um, get voted on. If there are three names, three or more names uh, nominated in the nomination process, then what will happen if there's a tie, uh, the lowest two that are tied will then have, again, a runoff. Basically, we'll pick one or the other through the nomination process. It feels a little bit uh, wonky the first time you go through it, but it, it should work out well. This is just following WASB's uh, prescribed election process. So any other questions? So at this time, what I'd ask you to do is write on your uh, ballot number one uh, your nomination for president, and then I'll have Tim Miner go around and pick those up. So we have two nominations for president. We have Jamie Johnson and Bruce Hansen. So at this point on ballot number two, if you would uh, write your, uh, your vote for board president.
So the board president will be Jamie Johnson uh, by election of the board. I will now turn over the rest of the election of officers to Mr. Johnson. So next up, our the board secretary is passing out ballots for vice president. Same procedure, the first ballot will be a nominating ballot. There will only be a voting ballot, election ballot, if there's more than one person nominated. Notice we have color coding too, so. So there are two nominations for vice president, uh, Rob Brown and Bruce Hanson. So on the next card, number two, if you would put who you're uh, voting for for vice president. We have no hanging chads. <laughs> we are going to reuse these uh, postcards, I hope, for something. They're very nice. I would like to keep mine, actually. They're almost a soft touch paper. I noticed that in the job descriptions under this policy 141 that they have the clerk position next under descriptions, but the order shall be elected in the following order. Treasurer will be next. We'll get that changed. <laughs> I guess we didn't, we really didn't, yeah. Uh, so the vice president will be uh, Mr. Bruce Hansen. So now we are in round three. This is for the treasurer position. Oh my, God, my computer's done updating. This is this is nice. By the way, I think that um, 
I informed Nick I was going to be out of the district over the weekend, but I didn't inform you, so I should have done that. Yeah. Just in case you. So we had three people nominated for uh, Office of Treasurer. The top two uh, nominees were Rob Brown and Carrie Whitaker. So if you could, uh, on the ballot, the treasurer ballot, I misspoke in the last one, please put the name of the individual. I don't know what, I don't know what the procedure is if this calls for this, but if I could withdraw from uh, keeping in mind the, the annual meeting and this uh, lengthy presentation that would be made. <laughs> so are you, are you refusing the nomination? I would like to withdraw from that nomination. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, we discussed a lot of these things today, but we didn't. So, so then we go, Tim, we go to the next one, uh, the, the top two if she withdraws. No. So there's three people. So then, okay, so then the other individuals is what we would go on to. So that would be the top two, which would be Rob Brown and Heather Logelin. So if you could put either Brown or Logelin on your ballot. So Rob Brown will be treasurer on the election. So the last office that we have is clerk. And so Tim will be passing out the clerk nomination forms. Head cook? Yeah, we can we could nominate a head cook. We have two nominations for clerk. We have Sandy Gerke and Carrie Whitaker. If you could go to your election ballot and put in the last name of the individual. Paperbacks or hard or both? Both. Mostly. 
one hill wall. And <laughs> she thinks that a lot of them are the ones she donated. Where and so, at? no, last year I donated ten to five. The one hole wall would be like the, the suspense books, the thrillers. The ones that I like. Seriously. The but can I buy the whole wall? Yeah. They do for bags, you know. I think on Saturday it's three dollars for a bag. I'm telling you, there's so many books there. You would you would have a heyday there. I mean, you gotta check it out. Just walk up. It's like people who donate them, like in the morning, or maybe it's a duplicate book, or is there a book there? Or By a total of the votes, Whitaker, uh, Carrie Whitaker will be the clerk for the coming school year. So with that, we have Jamie Johnson as board president, Bruce Hansen as vice president, Rob Brown as treasurer, and Carrie Whitaker as clerk. Very good. All right. Welcome to our new officer, Rob. And citizens request to speak about non-action items. Seeing none, we move on to recognitions then and uh, turn it over to Sandy Davis. Yes, gonna I have this right. one. Thank you very much. So at this time, I'd like to invite Amy Hamburg up to the mic. So tonight, we'd like to recognize Amy Hamburg, principal of E.P. Rock Elementary School, as a recipient of the 2017 Herb Cole Foundation Outstanding Wisconsin Leadership Award. Leadership Award recipients are school principals who are being recognized for setting high standards for instruction, achievement, and character, and creating a climate to best serve students, families, staff, and community. Leadership Award recipients are selected by a statewide committee composed of civic leaders, representatives of education-related associations, and the program's co-sponsors. Amy has been principal at EP Rock for the past 13 years, and I have a bit of a unique perspective in that Amy was my principal when I taught at EP Rock. And I can personally attest to the fact that she is a most deserving recipient who has a sincere and profound respect for all students. And also, uh, she's a committed advocate for teachers, the staff, and the profession in general. And with that, I'll turn over to Amy for a few words about the process and the award. Uh, well, first of all, I'm very humbled and honored <clears throat> to have received the nomination, but then also to have been selected. But from the moment I was nominated, it is an honor for the school. And I just wanted to show you that not only do I feel that way, but the Cole Foundation and Herb Cole himself recognizes the leader, but also um, gives a second award that will hang on the walls at EP Rock um, that says it's presented to EP Rock Elementary School for outstanding leadership and high quality learning opportunities that drive success for students and teachers. And so it is quite an honor. And um, at the very last minute at the recognition banquet, um, our awards were all doubled in the whole entire room so students uh, teachers and administrators um, will receive, so administrators will receive $6,000 for our schools and also for ourselves. Um, and my award will, will help uh, the students in our school and our mentor, support our mentor program as well as our angel funds, um, which help all the students in our school. And so it was a, it was a wonderful ceremony. Herb could not be there, but it was quite an honor. And I think the school board and the staff at EP Rock. So during this staff appreciation week. So thank you very much. Uh, any board members have yes, comments? I, I would, <clears throat> I always have a comment. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, one of the things I've learned about Amy is that um, if something's centered on her, she hands it right back to uh, staff and whoever's working on her team. Um, but I do see you as a catalyst, um, and I have kind of a visual image for you, and this is it. <laughs> you're, you're like a quilt because there's many parts that make up your whole. Now, in art classes, we call that gestalt, to use a fancy <laughs> word. But it, I, I think that, you know, that's the integrity that, that you have. And I, I have a couple quotes from the Herb Cole thing. One was, 
um, that they were specifically comment complimenting you on was that you inspire a love of learning and uh, your level of um, th that you you have a, you give to your teachers you let them have a level of confidence and that helps create and motivate the staff and every time you give over power like that and it comes back many folds that's an amazing gift thank you other board members bruce will you be down and recognized at the uh, annual convention then as well i know that they've had herb cultures come down for the annual event and um, i'm not sure about that <laughs> i would assume it would be the same thing wouldn't it the, these one? were regional the award um, banquets, so okay. I'm not sure if there's one beyond that. But. Okay. So well, he t yeah, he typically comes to all the regional ones, and he had some flight issues, I think, out of Milwaukee. Um, right, yeah. There were weather uh, issues. I know, you, but at the uh, state convention, you know, there's principals yeah, that get up for that. Yep. I know if that. Uh, well, it, it's a really spectacular accomplishment, <laughs> um, and it speaks leadership uh, or volumes to your leadership and the work that you're doing there. And, uh, EP Rock, so thanks for everything and the passion Thank that you, you bring. It's, got, Thank it's you awesome. Very much. Yes, Andy. Congratulations, Andy. Yeah. That's really an honor, and you Thank make you. Hudson proud. Yes. Well, glad you're Thank <coughs> you. glad you're here working with our kids and not somewhere else. Thank you That's very right. much. <laughs> I do appreciate it, and I think um, it's one of the things that is great about my job. I love coming to work every day, and um, I appreciate the support that I receive in Hudson. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Andy. I really like it when we can have balance among our teachers, our students, and administrators on getting these awards. So when we, um, Hudson gets recognized, it's good for all of us. But we're going. To, we have another recognition that we're going to have to um, postpone just a little bit because uh, that person is. Uh, attending another meeting and uh, we'll be here. So we will definitely uh, fit that in, um, likely to happen before our topics for action because it looks like we have uh, a good 45 minutes of reports. And uh, on that note, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nick for construction update. All right, thanks, Jamie. Uh, so touch on a few things. Uh, since we've last met, we did have bid opening on, uh, uh, would have been, April 27th, so it was Thursday, April 27th. Uh, open bids, um, you know, we came in, we were about 1.9 million over uh, what we had budgeted uh, for the project. So then on uh, part of the process that we did with the high school, with all of them, is Krause has asked for best value suggestions from all the different contractors when they submit their bids. So ideas as they're going through the plans and bidding things out where they say, hey, if you did this, you could save this amount of money, or if you did this, uh, so on Tuesday we met as a uh, as a team with uh, Kraus and Bray and and the district team, and we carved about two and a half million dollars out of that budget um, to get us you know below the budget amount which we knew we could do. Uh, and since then uh, we have also looked at uh, some other items that we could we could cut out. I'll give you some examples. Um, there, one of the big items that we cut out uh, at the Tuesday meeting, um, there was an, a lot of stone, that Bizon stone that was put on the building. Uh, it was put in places that really didn't need that level of finish. And so uh, we asked them to cut back the uh, stone budget by about a million dollars. And so we worked through that. Um, we worked through, you know, just different items as it relates to uh, moisture mitigation on our concrete slabs before we put carpet down. Um, it sounds kind of minuscule, but it was a three hundred and eighty-four thousand dollar deduct, and you know these slabs, and we've been uh, have been down for fifty and sixty years in a lot of the building, and uh, we've been putting carpet down on them for quite a while and not had any issues, and we don't use that that product at a time, and we've chosen not to use it at the middle school in the new addition, uh, because when you start to think about it, it's about four dollars a square foot to install new carpet. We could reinstall about 90,000 square feet of carpet uh, if we had some issues and so it just doesn't seem like that's an appropriate use of funds so we had you know a deduct coming there um, we had some different things uh, lighting fixtures came back there were some lighting fixtures in the commons and all of a sudden uh, Krauss Anderson Gary from Krauss Anderson caught it and said hey these are ten thousand dollars a fixture this is ridiculous there's 27 of them and so uh, so we talked to the electrical engineer and said 
two thousand dollars a fixture. That's what you need to get down to. I mean, they're really big fixtures. They light a large area, but two thousand dollars fixture. Well, you know, as we work through that, twenty seven times the eight thousand dollars savings. That's about another two hundred thousand dollar cut. That's not been uh, realized yet. So that'd be on top of the two and a half million we've already cut. Um, we, other things that we're looking at, uh, glass handrail that was specked out was, was quite expensive, um, to the point where I just, one of the things I told them is I didn't feel comfortable proceeding down that path. It was at $650 a linear foot and we had a thousand linear feet of it in the building and we think we could find a product. It won't be a glass handrail, but still be a very attractive handrail, uh, that we can use for closer to two and a quarter of square, uh, linear foot which, again, is like a half a million dollar difference. Um, so our goal, uh, as I told the architects, is we're not cutting just to hit a budget number. Uh, we're going through things with a fine-tooth comb uh, to reduce or to change things based on cost as well uh, so that we feel like the products that we're putting in the building, yes, they're nice aesthetically, but number one thing is they function, and they're functional. Um, and so just because we have the money, we're not going to spend the money. And so we are really uh, been very aggressive with that. Cross Anderson is very, very good about that. And I think to the architect's defense, in some cases, uh, certain things came back much higher than they uh, had come back in other, in, in other buildings where they've used those products and things along those lines. But um, so, we, so we're definitely looking, working through it uh, as far as the bid process with the high school. Uh, one of the things that's pretty light at the high school project is the FF&E budget. That's fixtures, furniture, and equipment. And so our goal was to add a million dollars to that budget because we're, you know, it's just, it's really light. We've got about $1.3 million in it right now, uh, and it sounds like a lot. Uh, but just to give an example, we could spend $150,000 just putting cafeteria tables in. Um, the window treatments that have to come out of that are about $300,000. So it gets eaten up in a hurry. And so our goal is to be able to bump that, that FF&E budget up to about $2.5 million, but still bring the project in well under budget and, and work through it and on time. As far as the project and how it's coming at this point, uh, the outside of the building, uh, if you've been by the high school today, you saw that they started asphalting the front parking lot. We anticipate that by the end of the week, the front parking lot will have both layers of asphalt on it, and they'll be striping it, uh, worst case scenario, on Monday, and we'll be driving on it or parking students on it either Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. So that'll be about 500 parking spots. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll shift those cars over there on the two existing lots, and start working on those those areas and start mining sand and, and some other things that have to happen. The uh, footings for the building on the concession stand have finally been poured. Uh, the track curbs have gone in. Uh, the asphalt track will probably start going in in another week and a half or so. Um, we're running in, we've run in some bad soils, uh, so that's been a challenge for us. Uh, we've pushed hard to get that number down. We have a really big pile of black dirt on the backside of the high school about 30 feet tall uh, and about the size of a football field. So we have a lot of extra black dirt. Um, so we are looking to get rid of that as best we can. But we know trucking it off site's not a real cost-effective option unless for some reason we need to um, bring sand in, in which case we could potentially do round-trip trucking so then it wouldn't cost us to haul it away, but we would be paying the trucking to bring the sand in. So we're working through some of those options. Uh, we have we had some challenges associated with some of our contractors and and not having everything in their bids and we've worked through those options uh, in I think a, a really good manner and a really good way. Kraus has been very good about that, um, but we are we are moving through pretty quickly. We will probably need to have some type of a, a special meeting sometime next week to get a couple of these contracts approved to get to get rolling because we do have work at the high school starting as soon as uh about the i don't know 25th of may and so kraus has been vetting and scoping all of these contractors not all 55 scopes need to be approved but we need to probably get out in front of i think he said 10 or 12 of them uh and uh and get those get those so we can get those things running um we are we've made some changes in direction as it relates to the uh uh, temporary chiller at one point I talked about bringing in temporary we talked about bringing in temporary chiller because we we're gonna have the new windows in the Northwest wing this summer as part of the remodel but not have any air conditioning hooked up and that could be really hot especially about the 17th of August uh, to not have any airflow so after looking at it and we saw it was about an $85,000 expense between the wiring the temporary hookups and the rental of the chiller 
I think what we've elected to do is to leave the existing windows in place in that remodel that wing except for the windows and then come back in next summer and do the windows because the current windows are operable. Uh, and they have some window air conditioning units and things like that, but um, the new windows won't be operable. And the biggest reason is, is because when people start opening windows in a system that's supposed to be running well, uh, it really throws everything off balance and creates some issues for us. Um, what you see up on the screen right now uh, is the retaining wall. That wall right there to the right has been built twice. Uh, the first time it was built three feet into lane eight. And so then it was reconstructed uh, oh. to the north. And uh, it took them about two days, but uh, it does look nice and they've done a nice job. Uh, this is an older picture. Um, and just before they got the curb in, uh, you can see some of the other, you know, portions of the wall as we as we're working through that uh we are still on track uh we're still on schedule with everything we look like we have a nice couple of weeks of construction coming up as far as weather goes um our our big thing right now is just uh one getting things finalized for bid back two and two getting all of our soil corrections done and what we're working on um if you have not had an opportunity to drive around the west or the north side of the high school uh i would highly recommend you do it it's it's quite amazing the way things look now compared to where they looked even a month ago so that is the high school project as it as it sits we're continuing to work through things the logistics and everything else associated with it up on the screen now we have the middle school project the middle school project is coming in on time um, what you see in those two pictures is the courtyard that was created uh, between the uh, the existing media center and the new addition uh, it's turned out very very nicely uh, it's a low maintenance it's got the big rocks and the low maintenance plants evergreens and things along those lines and then it has the uh, the granite chips uh, for sidewalks and things through there uh, so hopefully that'll be you know a much easier thing to maintain than some of the other things that were there to start with uh, the middle school upstairs the carpet is in ceiling tiles are in lights are on paint is done lockers are in uh, they're moving. They're working downstairs with paint and lights and ceilings, and even starting some flooring. Um, but uh, we're definitely working through the gym floor is going in this week, uh, and so that's really a sharp-looking uh, facility. Uh, with the uh, the ceilings are done, all the baskets are in, walls are painted, things along those lines. Middle school project is running uh, really, really far under budget. Um, you know, we're we're approaching that, you know, 15% range. I mean, it's really under budget. And that's even with doing the uh, parking lot, the bus plaza area, and also Merlin and Excalibur. So, um, you know, we'll be talking to the board. It looks like you'll be able to not have to put uh, the fund balance towards the middle school project. You'll either be able to apply it to something else, decommit it, or, or whatever it may be, but it looks like... Uh, that project is coming in well under budget and, and on time. Uh, we're working through the the issue we had with the gym floor because as I, if you remember correctly, I it got wet twice, uh, the existing gym floor. Uh, neither time was the fault of the district. And so we're working through with the different contractors on how that's all going to be um, restored and, and brought back and uh, just trying to work through some of those items. So... We're, we're getting through that, but it's just, again, we'll have to take that gym offline for about four weeks in order to make those repairs, so we're trying to also schedule when that would be. So with those things being said, as it relates to construction, uh, any any questions? Mr. President? Yes. Gross. Good update. Thank you. Um, the black dirt, I mean, are we opening that up for people just to come take it? Is there something that you <laughs> posted on that or is that well, something we have to be mindful of as what, a what, one of the things i think what i'd like to announce tonight what we were thinking of doing is we can throw a couple dump truck loads of black dirt in an area in the parking lot and from eight to noon on saturday we'll have somebody there and if somebody wants to come and load the back of their trucks up originally people want to know if they could you know come and have total excavating load their vehicles up for them and i said well you know that the, the excavators that are out there, they're scooping at about four and a half yards of scoop, which is about 9,000 pounds of dirt. And the typical pickup truck will handle about 1,200, 1200 pounds in its back. So if they were to drop even just one scoop of dirt on somebody's truck, uh, there wouldn't be a truck left. <laughs> and so, uh, and then, yeah, and of course, they don't want to bring in, they have smaller equipment, but they don't want the liability of loading people's vehicles. So we thought that the best way to go about it was, uh, you know, it's, it's, 
it really does almost nothing for us in the whole scheme of trying to get rid of it was to take three or four dump truck loads, put it in a corner of the parking lot, and people could come and get it as they need it. Um, just to give you an idea, the 40,000 yards of black dirt that we have extra is about 2,600 dump truck loads. So, uh, like I said, three or four dump truck loads doesn't do a whole lot. So, and somebody come in with a, you know, a, a pickup truck's about a one thirtieth of one dump truck load. So, yeah, we're doing it just probably more to just kind of be nice through the fact. But if there are people that have needs for uh, black dirt and we've put this out there and we kind of said it's kind of a 500 yard minimum, uh, then, you know, they could work with the excavator and they'd have to pay for their own trucking and everything else. But the dirt itself would be free um uh, but uh they would have to figure out you know how they're going to truck it to wherever it is they want it to go so okay. if you need 30 dump truck loads of dirt at your house that would be kind of our minimum yeah, that's I've the minimum just been is 30 dump trucks. About that that's much, about so 500 perfect yards. Yeah. yeah what's that <laughs> kidding yeah so yeah so it's it's uh it's a lot of dirt to say the least so thank you other questions Legislative update, um, you know, I think that the big things I want to hit on with the legislative update is with tonight, uh, we had five board members present, myself down at UW River Falls, uh, Speaker Voss and Representative Zimmerman were there. Um, there was a group of probably a total of maybe 12 or 13 of us between River Falls uh, District, Hudson District, and then the UW River Falls team. Uh, got some opportunities to really share the great things that are going on in our district. We had the opportunity to hear some of the things that are going on, obviously, in River Falls' district, um, but also getting a perspective of what Representative Voss is thinking about school funding. And it was interesting because, obviously, we know where Governor Walker stands. He's wanting to go 200 this year and $204 next year uh, in funding per pupil. Uh, Representative Voss, or Speaker Voss, has said that he has every intention of sticking the exact same amount of money that Governor Walker is is proposing, but maybe not in the same way. And I think some of the concern that uh, they were, might be dealing with is some of the low spending districts. Those would be districts that were frozen a long time ago when they put the uh, revenue limits in place, and they've been stuck low, and they haven't had the opportunity. To, they don't they don't have the ability to levy more to try to supplement uh, some of those districts as well. There's uh, primarily those districts I think are northern districts i think more rural districts for the most part but um uh, so i don't think it'll have a huge impact on the per pupil uh but uh to have the speaker of the house and the governor both come out and say the 649 million uh going to education is going to go to education one way or another is a good is a good start uh and they did say that it wouldn't be in the form of property tax relief either so i mean it would be actually new dollars coming to education one way or another so I think that's that's a big piece. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about the referendum laws, and you know them wanting to limit that. There's a several members uh, of the Republican caucus that would like to limit referendums and potentially put a two-year waiting period if after a failed one. The speaker did not feel that he was in part of that at all. He was his his only caveat is he would just like to probably eliminate spe special elections. Is that the way you took it, Jamie? Yeah. And, but. Um, you know, so you'd have an election availability in uh, in April, and election availability in November, and even in the off years of the general election, they'd still have a date in November. And so, um, so I think that you know it's it's reasonable because I think his concern was, okay, let's say we have a election, a regular scheduled election, April fifth. Why would a school district hold a special election on May tenth? You know, why wouldn't they just hold it on April 5th? And, and you know, I, I think a lot of people think that the districts do it because they think they're going to have an easier time passing it. But I think actually Brian would probably tell you that it's a less pass rate on special elections than on regular elections. So you have a better chance of passing. So I don't, I don't think that that wisdom holds true. Um, but uh, he talked about that a little bit. Uh, he talked about wanting to, you know, look at different ways uh, to attract um, people to the state of Wisconsin. What do you, we have 60,000 high school graduates every year in the state of Wisconsin, and they said they have 100,000 retirees leaving the workforce every year in the state of Wisconsin. Or job openings. Or job openings. So we have a net negative 40,000, um, which it does two things. One, uh, it creates for a very, very, very competitive job market for job seekers, uh, but two, can cause businesses eventually to say, I can't find employees 
maybe I need to move somewhere where I can. Um, but uh, he was very supportive of things. He was very supportive of the UW system. Um, his call to action with the UW system was they were given 2% raises in the UW system for two years. And his thought was it should have been more than that, which is kind of odd coming from Speaker Voss because I think he's pretty fiscally conservative. Um, but, uh, you know, he he wants to do more because I think he realizes that we have to attract and retain top talent both in K-12 and, and in the, the higher ed system. So that's the, the big gist of what's going on. I know you get the legislative updates from WASB, and then you get the Around the State Roundup from uh, from my email that kind of forwards on through from WASDA. But uh, – those are the big items going on right now. The budget is a, is a big piece. Uh, school start date. Uh, the governor has said schools will not support, uh, start before September 1st. So, I mean, he's kind of laid a marker in the sand that he's not going to, um, he would not sign a bill that would repeal the school start date in Wisconsin. So sometimes they do that as a bargaining chip. I don't know, because in the beginning of the session back in January, we were told there was a lot of appetite to change that but i think the tourism industry has really gotten uh revved up over that uh to if districts started earlier so that is primarily the legislative update uh, i will be down in uh, madison uh for a couple days this week uh part of that uh set of meetings has to do with uh seeing some legislators and um and talking a little bit about their updates and what's going on but um that's those are some of the biggest items as they pertain to our district there are a lot of education items, but those are kind of the, the big ones. All right. So that's my report. Any other questions on the legislative update? I just want to say good job on fellow board members being able to attend that. Um, that was five out of seven were there. Um, River Falls, which is where the meeting was, had two of their seven school board members there. And um, then there were always um, also representatives from the UW, River Falls. But good turnout on some board members part and I thought very good discussion uh, just as a segue then to board president's report um, tonight we're going to take action on the board um, meeting schedule for the next year but I think that we what we don't have in that schedule is any kind of uh, retreat and um, I just wanted to throw it out as part of the report of um, seems like when we try to set aside uh, meeting time, whether it's these work sessions for doing X or Y, whatever it is, then we end up having a meeting that has a bunch of other stuff and then it gets crammed in. And I think that, you know, it would be good, now we have a new board member, but um, have a, a retreat where, whether it's a Saturday morning, I don't know if we can get our legal counsel there, but um, having Shana come run through kind of some of the general legal stuff, uh, as we call it in the business. Um, and then we'll, uh, you know, and then also just have a nice conversation and about how we want to, you know, operate as a board moving forward. Um, so I, you know, we're now getting towards the end of the school year. Um, and we get into summer. I know how precious Saturdays are, but, uh, I'd just like to get some feedback from board members. What do you think of, of that idea? Or would you like to just tell Nick and the administration that, you know, we'll do the first two hours or dedicate a whole work session to just board retreat where there's no action items, um, just talking about general procedure and having legal counsel come. What do you think? Or we can pick a new, a different date, but still make it a weeknight. So weekends for, or, you know, Saturday morning or Saturday, you know, I was thinking something like an eight to three type of thing. If we were to have a retreat, it would be Ms. in town, but yes. Uh, Just a, a thought. We as a board have not been on a, a retreat and I think is a nice uh, stepping off point, perhaps uh, your idea of dedicating a work session without a real agenda as a first retreat, if you will. Uh, might be a good start and that we can talk about the value that it provides and maybe after that decide if we need a, a Saturday or, or something along those lines. Okay. Anyone else? I think we'll ask um, Dr. Ouellette and meet with the director, see which one makes sense. I mean, I think it makes sense to do it sooner rather than later. We've got one towards the end of each of the next three months. Um, so... 
if one of those we can make it just for a board retreat okay. unless board members have anybody else feel strongly about wanting to uh, give up a Saturday in the summer to do that I, I like the idea of a board retreat I with family commitments I can tell you I'm it's gonna be tough to get together before probably September yep okay that's what we'll do and then uh, the other thing coming up is uh, the spring Academy for board members um, I hope we we've got five board members I think that are going I just want to confirm uh, who's in I'm definitely going that's next Wednesday Thursday right no Wednesday it's a uh, Wednesday evening May 17 I'm, I'm attending all right Sue's in and it's at well we would leave here at five o'clock if dr. Nick is driving the bus so all right uh, to Turtle Lake to Turtle Lake right it's in Turtle Lake <laughs> I know where it is um, I, I would like to go but I think I land at like four four something that day I'll let oh you, you know. can make it <laughs> It might be 4:30 yet. It yeah. must be. But no, I I have I'll a plane you know, that lands um, that morning. I got a little more time than you. I need you to then. let you know, right? If uh, okay. Anyone else that knows that? Yes. All right. And Carrie. I had a plan to go next Thursday. Well, I I think it's it's next Wednesday, right? It's a week from Wednesday, and uh, again, if we can get most of the board members it'd be a great stepping off point for um, our retreat if we can get majority just drive yourself mm -hmm. all right Sandy's going Sue are you in all right and yeah. Heather's in all right yeah that's like so that's sinners at six or we leave we would leave here as a group at five but if you have other commit like Bruce his plane doesn't get until 448 so he'll drive direct the, there's a dinner served at 6, and then the meeting starts generally at 6.30. It's standing room only, yeah. so we're going to need to know ahead of time, Bruce. I'm driving myself. Okay. Because my husband will drive me, and he'll go to the casino. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so does he need anybody to go with him? I'm going <laughs> to I would prefer to ride with someone. All right, so we'll either do, uh, yeah, we'll do individual or carpool, but... That's great. If we can get all seven board members going to that, that would be um, a, that would be a first. So that would be great. All right. Um, other than that, I don't have anything. Um, and we'll we'll find something as far as a work session dedicated for a retreat. So. With that, um, monthly department updates. Oh, good. Sue, you got it here. All right. Well, then I'll turn it over to Sandy then for for this one. We have uh, right. recognition. Yep. We'll have. Holton Principal Sue Helmers, come up to the mic. I'll just give us a brief introduction. The U.S. Department of Education released on May 4th, so very recent news, the names of the 2017 U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Schools, District Sustain Sustainability Awardees, and Post-Secondary Sustainability Awardees. Across the country, 45 schools, nine districts, and nine post-secondary institutions are being honored for their innovative efforts to reduce environmental impact and utility costs, improve health and wellness, and ensure effective sustainability education. Holton Elementary is one of four award winners in the state of Wisconsin. Congratulations. They were recognized in April in Madison and are now invited to an award ceremony in Washington, D.C. on July 19th. And Sue, so we'll let you summarize a little bit about what what was in the application and the recognition of Holton? Sure. Um, DPI contacted me this past spring. Um, Holton had won uh, an, an award earlier. I think it was called a Ma Sugar Maple Award or something. There's different levels of these environmental ed awards. And um, asked if I'd be interested in pursuing this green and healthy school um, application. And so DPI came and met, and we worked through it this summer. Um, and it really is based on three pillars. One is reduced environmental impact and costs, improved health and wellness, and effective environmental and sustainability education. And so there was a lot of questions and um, 
opportunities to share what Holton had been doing. And so it really was a matter of reflecting on the work that was already kind of started at Holton. I feel um, like I'm really the recipient of work that has been in place for a long time and had a lot of these programs up and running. Um, and so it was, I felt like my job just to kind of continue them. And that is what we have done. So the state recognized us as one of, as Sandy mentioned, a few in the state. And then we were, um, our applications were sent on to the US Department of Ed, where we were then selected this week as one of the national schools of recognition. Um, so the highlights include student leadership groups that um, run a lot of these different committees. Um, we have an R3 committee. We have caring for our community com committees. We have a garden club. Um, also, a lot of the things that we do for health and fitness to include a family fun and fitness program that our FIAD teacher runs with recognition of kids that participate. Um, and probably the biggest thing would be our garden and greenhouse. Um, we just completed the greenhouse this last fall mm -hmm. and have been able to um, I, I honestly think there's probably thousands of plants in there right now. Um, but Sandy Madsen is a master gardener from Hudson who has worked very closely with Holton for several years um, and has created garden plots for each grade level that are aligned to their curriculum and that support what they do in their classrooms. And the great part is then whatever's harvested is brought into our lunchroom and served to the kids. And so they're very excited to eat things that maybe they wouldn't normally eat because they grew them. We have a lot of families that participate over the summer to help upkeep the garden. Um, and so it was a collection of all of those things that uh, helped move us onto this award. Um, but it really is a collective effort. Like I said, it's things that Anne has started many years ago and are just continuing as part of the culture. And that is one of the things they recognize is that even in change of leadership, um, things have continued and are still in place. And really that's um, speaking to the culture of Holton that it's not dependent on a person or a few people, but it's really just how the school works. And so um, we are very excited and very honored. And um, I just shared it with the kids on Friday and they are very proud of the work that they've done. So any questions? <laughs> Um, we had to do a one minute video and somebody, I was just at the parent group explaining this whole thing and they said that the video that we had to put forth for Holton had like 5,000 hits or something and so <laughs> I was just laughing because my son had one on there for some lip sync contest and I'm pretty sure that I got more likes than he did. <laughs> so thank you. Well, oh, just, uh, Sue, I just wanted to know, is yeah. that you in the picture there yeah. dressed up? <laughs> I'm in the banana costume. <laughs> you are? Okay. We were trying to debate which fruit, uh, the yellow fruit, that would be whether it, it was, was a, a banana. pear. A <laughs> banana. All right. And my custodian is, I believe, an orange. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Well, President, I'd just yes. like to make Sue. a comment. I'm, congratulations, Sue. Um, I was, my, the thing I thought about when I read this was that it's like this is refreshing to my ears to know that as I get older, I'm, I'm, these children are going to be around to be uh, leaders and preserve the environment and learning about respect for others and uh, will be receptive to collaboration. I just think those are great, great investments. So thank you. Yes. Congratulations. So very nice award and very well deserved. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for, you know, leading uh, this whole effort. I know it's comprehensive and there's a lot of folks involved, but... I just think in a district which used to be a huge farming community and now I don't know that whether we have any family farms function anymore within the school district, um, at least the traditional, you know, uh, you know, pork and dairy and so forth, but just to be able to have kids working in the dirt and understanding, you know, how food is produced and so forth, I think that it's it's great rounding out of the education. So thank you. I have you. had several families that have said their kids are really pushing and urging them to do gardens at their own homes now. And so I think a lot of that has to do with their experience at school. My brother is a hobby farmer, and um, I did not inherit that <laughs> gene. <laughs> so he thinks this is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Mr. President? Yes, Rob. You know, Sue, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, 20, 30 years from now, when these students have their own kids, they're going to reflect on this and will have applied this throughout their lives and will be teaching their kids what they've learned here. Yep. So it's, this is definitely something that will continue to be paid forward. So, I mean, kudos to you and congratulations to the team. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. 
All right, um, moving on to monthly department updates. And uh, Nick, did you want to just point out, or yep. we're not going to actually run through all We're, we're going to run through all 40 pages. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so in an effort to try to continue to provide the board with information of the ongoings of the district, uh, what you have is uh, department updates. Those would be, as of right now, the plan is to have them be a, a monthly part of the board packet so that it's not anything that we would actually go through it just more for your information and for the information of the community if you have questions about the uh, department updates as, as anything you, know, you get these things earlier please let me know ahead of time so that if a i need to have one of the uh, leaders here to be able to answer questions or i need to find out information that i'm not able to answer that uh, we're able to do so otherwise what happens is you have a question on a night like tonight and then you won't have an answer for a couple weeks until we have our next meeting uh, or at least the public wouldn't have an answer to that question so um, so feel free to peruse those uh, I think there yeah there is probably about 30 or 40 pages we're just working to again just all the different things that are going on in the district not just in the buildings but in the different departments and and uh, so that you kind of have a, a handle of what those things are so is this the idea is to have these under the report section every month or yep. would it be under consent agenda? Nope, these would be under the report section and just be written reports. And so um, you're not approving them, you're just, they're just part of the agenda. So, okay. Thank you. yep. Very nice. All right, moving on then low or negative balance practice for meals and uh, so, Tim, are you handling this one? Yeah, right. Peggy and I will be uh, talking through this one with you. Um, just to give you an, uh, kind of a background on this, and Peggy will go into a little more detail on it, uh, the USDA has, has looked at practices uh, with districts and how they're handling uh, negative balance uh, accounts for, for kids. And so uh, what they're requiring is that uh, districts put into place a written procedure policy or practice and so uh, we looked at this and um, one of the things we've always had a procedure in place um, we're looking at changing things a little bit uh, what we want to do is it was we want to make sure and part of the part of the uh, the idea behind this with USDA is not uh, putting a mark on the student so to speak and so as we looked at this we wanted to do that certainly with an eye to to that um, and not drawing attention to the student as they go through a line, that type of thing. And also, um, we wanted to strike a balance, making sure that kids get uh, a meal. Uh, we don't have kids go hungry here, and we never have. And so we want to continue that practice. We'll be changing things up a little bit, and, and Peg will walk through that a little bit as we, as we talk. Um, and so, again, this is, a, this is a procedure that we've drafted up, and we'll go through it, and certainly feel free to ask questions as, as we go through. But uh, I'll turn it over to Peg to elaborate a little bit more on it. Thank you. Um, the National School Meal Program was designed to provide affordable meals to the schools. All families have access to those meals, those that can afford the meals, and those who um, need some assistance. Now, schools across the country have struggled um, with unpaid meal debt, sometimes to the detriment um, of the meal program and to their general fund. I'm sure you've all heard the horror stories of refusing meals or throwing food away. Um, not that that has ever happened in this community. But these are very rare exceptions, but are examples of how some schools have tried to deal with rising debt in their school district. That has led the directive by the USDA that all schools must establish a standard of practice or a policy to dictate how the unpaid meal account balances are handled and that this practice must be made known to all school personnel, families, um, and to the community. And that is what brings us the policy or the procedure that you have before you. Our past practice, although written and publicized, was not always co followed consistently. We did not allow charging of meals or a la carte at the secondary level. The elementary schools um, could offer an alternate meal to accounts that were more than $25. That was a choice. We probably used the alternate meal on very rare occasions, maybe five to 10 times a year. Um, this proposed procedure um, that is before you states that every child will receive a meal regardless of their count balance. The families are notified at the beginning of the year and throughout the year of this procedure and the systems are in place to, and what systems are in place to fund their account and to check their balances. And that would be our current fee pay system that's available to all families at no charge so they can check 
their balances at home. Students who have money um, to pay for their meal will, pre will be provided uh, a meal. It cannot be used to repay any meal debt. We have always worked with parents and will continue to work with parents to collect the unpaid meal balance at several uh, numerous contact periods. Children are able to check their account balances at the register and at the secondary levels we have what we call net cash machines where they can check balances and deposit money. We also send uh, low balance or negative balance slips home weekly with elementary students informing their parents of the low or negative balances. Accounts that are over a negative $25 will now receive a letter which they had also in the past stating that payment is expected. Failure to pay may lead to ref a referral to a collection agency. If there are extenuating circumstances, we will work with that family on a payment plan or application process for subsidized meals or other support such as our angel, angel funds. Delinquent accounts that are deemed uncollectible are referred to as bad debt and are an unallowable expense to the school nutrition fund and therefore are offset by the general fund. It is the intent of this procedure to offer meal service to all of our students while defining the actions to collect any delinquent or bad debt. This meet, thus meets the USDA regulations. Um, any questions? I, I basically summarized uh, the um, points that are brought out in the procedure. Mr. President, I, I have so. one question. Yes. Um, Peggy, thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, when, when you say we will provide the child with a meal yes. you know, so they don't go hungry at right. lunch, um, the definition of meal is as for any kid that is pain, they can say I'll have chicken fingers or whatever. Yes, and they'll have their yeah. Yes, they will right. receive It's not like we just meal, give them meal. a no. peanut butter and jelly nope. sandwich and say good luck. Nope. Okay. Nope. They will just, there will be, it will be a seamless process. They will go through and select whatever they would normally select. There it will be no difference um, whether they have a balance or a, or not. Peggy, Andy. you said that the uh, any shortages are offset by the general fund because there cannot be debt owed. Bad debt cannot be um, a cost of um, of the meal program. Of the meal program, Tim. Okay. Maybe you can talk. Right. More to that. So, yeah. So that the the change in what we're doing, what we're looking at here, is more uh, making sure that that student gets the gets the meal, um, and it's not an alternate meal like we like Peggy's mentioned in the past. Sometimes we've had that alternate meal of a sandwich. Um, so this one is to serve the serve the child the meal um, that was chosen, and so if we get to a point with some accounts, and I'll give you an example. Right now we're running about, I, I think we've got about three hundred dollars worth of delinquent uh, would be probably more delinquent accounts. So uh, that's been as high as two thousand dollars. So based on two and a half million dollars of revenue, it's very very low. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is one of the requirements of USDA is if the if we deem the account, uh, it goes into delinquency, if we deem the account as uncollectible, saying we're just probably not going to collect this, uh, general fund does have to cover that. Um, however, uh, there are ways that we can, we can look at the program uh, over time. You know, if, we, if it becomes an issue, we'd come back here uh, for maybe possibly a tweak of the policy or the procedure, rather. Um, we'd also look at, you know, um, lunch prices overall are we're very low in our CESA, as you've seen the comparisons as we've gone through uh, with the setting lunch uh, prices. Uh, we could look at uh, covering some of those costs by by increasing lunch prices. So there's there's a number of different ways, but the idea is uh, right now um, our our bad debt or our uncollectible delinquent accounts are very very low, and they have generally tracked very low over the over the time over time period so are there at, by the end of the year when the kids are out of school um, and if parents still owe after that for the summer do you send you don't send anything to collection agencies or try to collect it that way we we have but very rarely most we just don't have that many bad debts um, but in in a policy here what we'd say is 
if the account reaches a negative $25, um, the, there'd be a notification sent out. Um, we'd work with the families. A lot of those folks that when they ha when that happens, they eventually catch up. Okay. And sometimes it's just individual situations. So it's not we blanketly send it to collections, but we'll work with those families. And then if it gets to a point where the, the balance keeps building, we will then then we you know as the last alternative, we go to a collection agency. Does that can you take private uh, donations to that fund? Um, yeah. Yes, and that's what yeah. I was referring to, the angel fund. Currently, we have a district-wide angel fund, and some of those um, uh, dollars have been designated to uh, meal account uh, negative balances. And I would say that uh, negative balances, currently our practice is we carry that negative balance over for a year. So if they end the year uh, in a negative balance, when they start up in the fall, they'll a lot of times they pay that negative balance along with uh, prepay so we'll probably carry it for a year it's the when they determine it's uncollectible that we've s taken it to the collection agency and we're not collecting it it gets written off as bad debt and that's the amount that the general fund would be responsible for but okay. we can carry delinquent debt on the school meals fund okay and what is the angel fund that it, it's a, um, a it's a fund that the school district has um, when donations have come in that someone, well, I, I, a perfect example is a senior graduating and they have $25 in their account. The family says, I'd like to donate that to the angel fund, which means it goes into okay. a fund that we can draw from. And um, the administration, like the principal of that school, along with the our department, define whether that's a need for that family. And then we um, would uh, offset their debt. If we have students that go, <coughs> Become, they don't get their application in right away and they become free or eligible for free or reduced meals, but before they filled out the application, they um, built up maybe $20 in debt that they aren't, can't pay and we can't go backwards to put them on free meals, then the angel fund would cover their debt. Okay, thank you for the explanation. Certainly. That's helpful. Certainly. Heather? Any other questions? Yeah, well, just a quick comment. So I, I think this policy is about as good as you could hope to see. Um, I don't know. I mean, meal shaming is, is what they're calling it. It's, there was a huge New York Times article over the over the weekend, so it's a big deal because some districts have been giving kids big like marks on their hands that they walk around with all day. Scarlet so, letters, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, I mean, this I think is is Peanut wonderful. Butter sandwiches. So thank you for for getting it on paper. I think this is. I mean, and the nice thing is, we're a district that can be this. Yes generous, if you will, because of our relatively low incidence of kids that end up in this situation, so we're, we're blessed that way. Um, at some point, it would be nice to hear more about the angel funds at the different schools, because I think <coughs> some, some school-based funds exist, so for a different time, that might be a yeah. neat... Um, and the angel funds aren't necessarily tied to food service. No, They're right, tied right, to all right, different types of fee, right, yeah. fees that the kids may incur. Yeah, I guess one, one point of clarification for Tim, so, the, uh, so raising the cost of meals to help s offset this is not a is not an option because you said that you can't settle it with food service fund balance well yeah they, what they're requiring is as we went through this we found what they're requiring is if it's if it's deemed a bad debt then they they tell you that the general fund has to cover it rather than a food service so then that means even if there is money in the food service balance we can't use that to offset it right but we you know this is something we'll monitor very closely we want to make sure that going forward that it's sustainable and now is that a is that a new provision they've just put out? Peggy, is that no? Uh, no, I, no? I, it's always been in there that bad debt cannot. But I think where okay. the difference that you don't see it is schools that don't have a balance and they're drawing from the general fund because they have now and they are sitting there with forty thousand dollars worth of bad debt. That's the money that they've written off. But the school meals program doesn't have a fund balance um, that we're fortunate enough to have in our district. So. So school, so the fund balance in the nutrition account cannot be used to offset bad debt. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Right, not for bad debt. So yeah. raising lunch prices to help offset bad debt would serve no real purpose. That w yeah, that probably would not not help okay. us. So yeah. I just wanted to make sure it's clear so, because there's yep, kind of yeah. two different. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. That that was a mistake on my it, part. It can remain as delinquent, and it can remain in the food service as an asset, um, as a. Receivable. As a receivable, yeah. yes. And can it, can it stay delinquent? Is there a time period in which it, it can't be delinquent anymore? I didn't see any real definition of the steps state, we'd have to take. State agencies yeah. may de determine what they consider a, 
appropriate time. I don't know that Wisconsin has one. I've seen a year, yeah. and I've seen, you know, none that it can stay delinquent forever. Is there a way for the general fund to be paid back using fund balance from nutrition fund? No. My. I don't believe there is. Potentially allocating costs to the general fund or to the nutrition fund that maybe are being paid for out of the general fund that we, would fall within the legal limits of being able allocated. Yeah, we we allocate different expenses to them, different insurance expenses and that type of thing. Right now, wow. um, we can we can look for something if there's okay. something else out there we might okay. be able to allocate over. Mr. President, may I? Yes. It doesn't Andy. appear like this is a huge problem, a no. financial problem for the school district of Hudson, but this is a great policy. Thank you for creating this because it would be awful to have any child Absolutely. stigmatized because they don't have money in a fund for a decent lunch. Absolutely. And it would be even worse if they didn't get fed at all. So thank you for this. And I, I can honestly say there's an, I, that I know of that we've ref ever refused right. a child a meal. I wouldn't expect that you so. would have. Right. Thank you very much for the report. Okay. And we'll see how the practice goes. We'll get a report in a year, I suppose, right? Right. Yep. We'll follow up. All right. Very good. With that, we'll bring Brian up to the front for the referendum f um, final financing plan. Yeah, so as you recall, um, this will be our final $10 million issue uh, to complete the financing for the referendum. And uh, Brian and I have looked at some, uh, we've proposed three different options out there. So uh, one of the options, again, going traditionally with the uh, with the 20 year bonds and another one will give it give us looking at uh, notes so 10 year notes and so Brian will run through some of that detail what we're looking for is some direction from the board as far as um, bringing this back on the on May 30th meeting for action so but we'll go through this and then uh, we'll certainly ask questions of Brian and we'll go through and uh, hopefully get some direction from you so I'll turn it over to Brian Is that, is that better? Okay. All right. Um, as Tim introduced, uh, we I'm, good. I'm here tonight to update you from our uh, previous discussion in January on the, the final um, component of the referendum financing. Um, and so far, so good this year with interest rates. Uh, if you flip to page three of your handout, um, this is that interest rate trend chart that I've used uh, over the years with the district. Um, and you look at the far right of the, the chart and you see that over the last three weeks to a month, interest rates have actually moved lower uh, this year. And a lot of that has to do with uh, some of the political um, uncertainty, some of the, the proposals um, uh, that you know, Congress can't, can't agree on yet, um, uh, as well as some of the um, um, airstrikes in Syria, North Korea, you know, those types of things generally move investors to want safe investments, which the Hudson School District bonds are safe investments. Municipal bonds in general are safe investments. So um, that's why you've seen rates move a little lower here, uh, which is why uh, Tim and I thought we would uh, bring to you an option for, for locking in the, the final step at your next meeting on November 30th. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out on the uh, visual, I gotta point it at Tim. That might be it though. Sometimes it works, sometimes yeah. It so just as a refresher, um, that low point that you see just just off the right side of the page, um, the district locked in the first 80 million of the financing, 80.4 uh, million, uh, just prior to that, that lowest point in this last 30 years. So because of the uh, favorable timing with the approval of the referendum and the locking in of the majority of the, the debt at that time, uh, you're currently on track to being approximately $14 million under your referendum interest cost estimate. Um, and so the other thing you, we, we discussed in the preliminary uh, planning we had talked about locking in the longest maturities first, and then you know if we're going to retain 10 million for a future year, 
locking in shorter maturities thereafter. And part of that strategy was because if you look at that top line on the chart, it moves more rapidly. And as you see here, um, rates post-election moved higher on that longest maturity, but didn't move as much on the shorter maturities, the five and the 10 year. So the last 10 million that we're discussing is in that first 10 years uh, with one final maturity in 2037. So, so far so good with the, the planning and, and how we um, structured when and how to lock in the interest rates on, on the financing plan. So Tim, if you'd move it. So just a refresher of the financing goals from the beginning. Uh, we wanted to meet or, or uh, the 90 cent uh, interest rate or mill rate increase for referendum approved debt. Uh, we were phasing the financings to provide future repayment flexibility and with an overriding goal to try to, to minimize the total financing cost. Um, the long-term credit rating will be uh, evaluated by Moody's Investor Service. Um, I expect that you would receive the AA1 again when we go when Tim and I go through the process, which I, for those of you that may recall, that that's one notch off the highest that Moody's offers. Um, during the referendum, we had used planning interest rates that range from a 3.75 to a 4%. That first 80 million was locked in at a 2.73%. And this final 10 million is, is ultimately dependent on the discussion tonight of how, how we decide to structure it and uh, what rates are when we go to lock it in later um, over the next month. The, the, two, the two averages that we're discussing are 2.4% if we want to amortize over a 10 year period. And then if we want to do a 10 year with a, that 20th maturity, that would be a blended average of a 3.2%. So either way, we're still well under the referendum estimates that we had been using. And the, the repayment structure, we were structuring the new principal payments around the existing referendum approved debt payments, ultimately with the goal of leveling out the mill rate increase each year after the impact to state aid. Uh, with some future prepayment uh, provisions that allow you to pay down debt um, as the district grows and, and changes, you, you have decisions annually as to how much you levy to pay down debt in future years. So, Tim, if you'd move forward. So this was the, the original illustration. Um, I just put it here as a, as a reminder. I, we don't need to spend a lot of time aside from the goal was leveling out at $1.87, which represents a 90 cent increase over the uh, pre-referendum debt mill rate of 97 cents. And the total principal interest in state aid totaled about $145 million. So as we flip to the next page, Tim. This is the, uh, an update of the um, scenario where we would stretch the debt out to that 20th year um, now using interest rates that have a planning cushion of 20 basis points. So the blended average that you see there um, on the long-term bonds is a 3.2. Right now, y if we were able to lock it in tonight, it would, it would be closer to 3% at this point. Um, and if you see in that lower right corner, I've been tracking the, um, principal and interest versus that, that planning estimate of 145 million, where this scenario would be 131 million, which would lock in that 14.1 million un under the referendum estimates. So the, before we leave this one, this was how we had originally laid out the plan that we would lock in this 20th year as part of this time period. But the next scenario is something that Tim and I have been working on that may allow you to pay down debt a little quicker, re reduce interest costs even further, and provide you some flexibility such that if the, the project comes in under budget um, or the growth is, is property valuation growth is faster than what we had conservatively um, projected or, or used for the illustrations, it would allow you to, to pay down the debt even quicker and potentially minimize or eliminate that the need for that that 20th year on, the, on this financing. 
So if we flip to that next one, Tim, please. So what you would, what you would lock in, in at your next meeting would be a 10-year note with a maturity. I show a million and a half here, but that maturity would be four and a half million. So it'd be a, about three million that you'd have to rework or pay down as we go through the next 10 years. I put an example three million that would match the visual from the previous page so that you would be using that 2037 year. And I'm showing the interest cost um, difference, the interest cost avoidance is about $450,000 higher in this scenario. And that's using a 4.5% rate on that 10-year issue out in the future. So if you, were to, if you wanted to keep that 2037 maturity, rates could go as high as 6% if you kept this exact structure before you would, you would be worse off doing the 10, the 10 million now this way. So, but because you had that 400,000 of interest cost savings, we used it to pay off more principal in these first nine years. So it allows you that flexibility to pay down the debt quicker. So Tim, if you would flip to the next slide. We also ran a scenario that said, you don't necessarily need to put it as a balloon out in that 2037 year. You, you could choose to level out the repayment out in the future. And if you do that, you're, you're paying down that debt quicker here, and it further reduces the interest cost. So instead of 14.6 million, it's about 14.7, um, between 14.7 and 14.8. What's not shown here is the fact that we are still using the conservative estimates of property value growth of 2% for two years and then 1% thereafter. Um, last year, the district grew 5.5% which if that happened again and you were able to grow at you know a one to two percent thereafter that would allow you to levy annually and keep your debt mill rate at that dollar 87 and use that to just pay down that three million dollars so so in a in, in effect if that growth is faster than what we had conservatively projected you may avoid this interest cost altogether but it just gives the board options as you finalize the bidding, see how the growth numbers come in, see how the state aid comes in, um, see how your long range capital planning process goes. It just gives you a little bit of flexibility to, to work with while locking in a rate that's currently around 2% on that final component of the, um, the referendum plan. Okay. So Tim, if you would, So the discussion that, that uh, Tim Erickson and I had had was um, because of that flexibility and because of the reduction in interest costs, um, we think the, the general obligation promissory notes, so the 10-year structure, locking in the rates that are in that low 2% range, and then managing that final payoff over the next nine years uh, puts the district in um, the best situation to, to achieve the lowest financing cost. Um, and so the, on May 30th, we would have paperwork ready and rates um, locked in for board approval that night to finalize that uh, remaining $10 million. Um, and then we'd have a prepayment provision built into that issue so you can pay it down as, as um, your annual var school vari state aid variables and school levy variables allow. Uh, the payments would begin in 2018 you would have three years to spend this, this final $10 million, um, you know, according to your, your spending plan. Um, and I summarize these as I was speaking through, through the presentation, but, you know, there's a number of ways that I believe the district will be able to chip away at, that, at paying down that debt each year as you move through um, uh, the years up until that final maturity. And I think the other, the final thing that we had talked about is that, you know, if you, if there is some capital improvement planning that happens over the next 10 years with other facilities, um, this 
financing, you know, if there is a, a balance left on that final maturity, we could finance the remaining number of years with a portion of the other capital uh, projects if, you know, if there in fact is a need to, to finance that using uh, debt financing. So summary, rates are still low. They've gotten lower since January. Um, we're still very, uh, uh, we're in a very favorable environment in a great position to lock in significantly better than what you, you would discuss with the public during the referendum. Um, so any questions uh, on, the, on the plan or? Mr. President? Yes, Sandy. I have a few questions. Okay. It's my understanding, tell me if I'm wrong, that this is the last 10 million that we did not borrow it last year, right? Correct. Okay, we borrowed the 80 something, this is gonna make it 90. Okay, at the time we didn't borrow this, um, there was a comment made, I don't know, remember by who, but about if we, if we may not have to borrow at all because we didn't know where the bids were gonna come in, we didn't know how much it was all gonna cost, mm -hmm. but we may not have to borrow all of it. So have we found that we do need to borrow all of this? Because I'm going back to what Nick said mm -hmm. about the middle school project coming in 15% less than we planned. So why isn't that reflected in the 10 million? Am I missing something? No, absolutely. So, um, so Brian's calculations are just based on the last 10 million of the original <laughs> debt. So yeah, the board could, the board could borrow 10, 9, 8, 5, 7, you know, whatever you want to, whatever you want to borrow. Um, we just asked them to put together the um, the items as it, as it related to the last 10 million. The thing is with the high school, uh, the high school project. Um, I mean, we'll be we'll be right up against the the budget. I mean, we might be able. To, you know, our goal is to bring it in under budget, but as you know, as we get through it, we'll have a better handle on those things um, and how much of, let's say, the contingency fund we have to use and how much of those types of things. With the middle school, you know, trending around a million to a million one under, um, you know, the big question for the board would be, okay, do you just not borrow uh, the, you know, one, one and a half million or, what, or whatever, that, uh, whatever that is at the middle school and use fund balance on it? And or do you borrow the money and take the fund balance and potentially use it on your uh, potentially seed money for the district tenure plan if you want to do if you want to do it that way. So it is completely up to the board what you want to borrow or how much you want to borrow. The one thing that I have said is we're not going to take any savings that we have from the middle school and put it over to the high school. No, we can't because we told the people that we were going to spend X amount of dollars Correct. on the high school, X amount on the middle Correct. school. Correct. So you really can't float the money. No, out. so, but the thing you could do is you could say, hey, we have committed $800,000 of secondary space funding to the middle school fund balance that we've had in the general fund. Okay. You have the ability at the board table to de, to de uh, commit that. Okay. And so you could still use it for facilities, you just could use it on a different facility. Take the 800000 that we've committed out of the, um, the, uh, little, general fund. the general fund yeah. to the middle school project. And because you don't de need it. Decommit yeah. that. Yeah. Use eight hundred thousand of this of the m money that we already have for it. Yep. And take the eight hundred thousand and do, do something else. With well, it. like you could do. Yeah. I mean, you could say, okay, well, we're working on this ten-year facility plan and trying to put that together. You could say, oh, well, we want to put it towards that ten-year facility plan. Start to do those projects so that we don't down the road need to tax okay. to start those projects. I mean, in the end, you know, you can do it a variety of ways. You could say, nope, let's let's spend the eight hundred thousand in fund balance. Let's not. Let's not sell the last, let's say, let's say we only sell nine million two hundred thousand in bonds instead of uh, instead of ten million dollars in bonds. But then what would happen is, you know, as we go through that ten-year facility plan that we've been talking about for about the last six or seven months, you may say, okay, in order for us to fund that ten-year facility plan, it's going to be X amount of dollars every year, and so in order to get those X amount of dollars every year, you're going to have to levy. You're gonna to have to levy those dollars in order to uh, get them. You don't need to borrow them because it's not because we're under levied. But uh, so really, before we you know sell the last 10 million, you can make that determination. Or Brian, correct me if I'm wrong. If we do levy for the last 10 million, or I'm sorry, borrow for the last 10 million, you could use some of the bond proceeds. That if let's say a year from now the board decides, okay, we don't want to decommit. We just we want to spend the you know we want to buy down the bonds. You could use that money 
than to make bond payments, correct? That, that's the only other option you have. The only it's other option. projects that were approved or pay down, pay down that, the debt that was borrowed. The, the reason we were pushing for now is because right now late rates are really low and we don't know. I mean, they could go up. They couldn't, you know, originally the Fed started raising rates earlier this year. Then all of a sudden they've held them steady a week ago. They could start raising them again. And so it was one of those things where we thought, okay, we lock in this next $10 million, And worst case scenario, let's say the project comes in $5 million under budget. You could take that $5 million and pay back the bonds that you've borrowed. You said worst case. I think that would be pretty good. <laughs> that would be best case scenario. I mean, it really, I mean we really are shooting to, to try to bring it under budget. But it's, it's – um, it's a really big remodel at the high school. And as everybody, I think, up at the table knows, once you start digging into things, you know, we can't count on the fact that we're not going to need all of our contingency. I mean, I'd love to say we're not going to, but we just don't quite know what we don't know yet. So our thought was locking in now, and then if we, you know, the board could have further discussion on what they want to use that fund balance for. And then you could always say, nope, we want to use the fund balance for the middle school take this money and pay down bonds with it or make bond payments with it. Mr. President. Rob, a question for Tim. The uh, escrow interest that we had on the $80 million, do you have an idea where that's at, what the sum is? Yeah, we'll, we'll generate uh, somewhere between like 850 and maybe just under a million dollars, less the, the arbitrage that we might have, we may have to pay. So, but that'll be that'll be allocated to each project. So, it'll be alloc par portion of that will be allocated to the high school project, a portion to the stadium and the auditorium, and then a portion to the middle school. So, the but it, by and far the biggest amount of that will be allocated to the high school project. But that's that's al also included in our numbers when we're talking about uh, where we stand, as Nick talks about where we stand right now. Yeah. And so they have to be those dollars. That interest has to go towards the project or pay down the debt. Is that right? The right, so yeah. Okay. Okay. Just one last question. Um, we borrow the whole ninety million. The middle school comes in a million under. We can use as much as we need on the high school. What we told the public we were going to spend no more than that. If we have money left from this borrowing, the only thing it can be used for then is to pay down this debt that got involved. Th these bonds, correct? Okay, so we can't take that money and use it anywhere else. We can't do anything else with it. We can't apply it to anything else. The, the, the big thing you could do is, like I said, you, you've committed $3.5 million in fund balance between the high school project right. and the middle school project. Yeah. So, yeah. so you could arguably say that there's $3.5 million between the two projects that could be spent on yeah. other projects right. in a different way. Um, okay. But the actual money that is borrowed that people voted for can only go towards projects at the middle school, only go towards projects at the high school slash auditorium and stadium, and only the dollars that they voted for in those each area. So you can't say, well, the middle school is a million under. Let's take those voted on dollars and put it on the high school because they were two totally separate questions. Okay, I get that. Thank so, you. Thank yeah, you for the explanation. We, we ran them as separate questions for just that. Some districts will blanket everything together and say for facility projects around the district. In that case, you know, they're interchangeable, you know, as they, na as they name them. But we specifically named certain sites for the dollars so that we were very well, it's transparent. A to, it's a good idea to do it now if interest rates are this low. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be higher six months from now. So I, I have no problem with doing it now. I just wanted to make sure I understood <laughs> that all the money is going either into the back into paying the debt, it's not going to be used for anything else except what's involved here. Correct. So the money you saved on the middle school could eventually lower the money that we take out of the general fund or repay some of this debt. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you for the explanation. I appreciate it. Mr. President. Bruce. Or, or all of those scenarios could be p possible, or it also could be used to potentially take on other areas within the school that may have or maybe part of our 10-year plan as well, right? Yeah, I mean, you could say, you could say, wow, we really liked what you guys did with these new houses. Can we do it with four more houses at the middle school? You know, like the renovation of the house structure? So because it's the same site, you could choose, hey, we want to do, you know, four more houses like that, or we want to, you know. So, yes, that is another option with that funds because the funds are specific to the building site. Okay, so we could use the extra million and a half at the middle school that we've already saved 
to mm -hmm. redo something else at the middle school that was not in the original referendum, that was not explained to the public? Well, it was explained to the public. It was in the original question for improvements and additions to the, the question. But I would, one of the things that we have been very general about or very specific about is we've been trying to protect scope creep. That's why we're 1.1 million under because we're not just taking the money and putting it in other areas of the building. And so that's why, um, I mean, because we easily could have done that. And the one thing we wanted to do is not do that because that's not what we told the public we were going to do. We told the public we were going to remodel Merlin Excalibur, deal with the bus plaza, and add 12 classrooms and a gym. That's what we told people. That's what we're doing. That's why we're a million point one, give or take, under. And so that's what we're sticking with. If the board chooses to do something different with it, that would be up to you guys. Mr. President, yeah, I think the the point I was making there is there are areas that are still and probably were on the ATS and our report from like three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think it's um, it's just I'm not saying that we need to go spend it. I'm just suggesting that you know there there are areas or items that we need to make sure we're focusing on as a district as well. And just be mindful of it. But the other opportunity is to pay down some of the debt earlier if we can as well. So I think to get the money at this low of a rate um, paid off well for us, uh, you know, earlier in the $80 million And I'm actually surprised that they're staying as low as they are right now. Yeah. They've ra the Fed has raised twice in the last four mo five months, and rates have kind of stayed flat to moved a little lower, partly because there was some expectation in the market already that, that there would be an increase, and partly, as I've discussed, that, that Fed rate is, a, is the very, very short rate, whereas the long-term rate is more about GDP growth, inflationary pressure, you know, safety of funds for a long period of time. And when you have global instability, you know, U.S. Treasuries, even though they're paying 3% and under, are still a very safe place to put your money, and that's that's what municipal bonds are generally based off of. So, there's a lot that goes into why rates are still long-term rates are still very favorable. Mr. President, uh, Brian, with the way the uh, the debt is structured, you know, from a prepayment uh, standpoint, uh, there are some bonds we can pay off early, some we can't. And so, say we wind up with you know two three million dollars, will there be enough available bonds to pay off? Yes. Yeah. So, so the 80 million um, uh, that you locked in last year has a 2026 call feature. Uh, there's an issue that has a 2023 call issue, and then what we're thinking about for this one is a 2024. So, um, what's available there? Uh, it would be the, the all of the four and a half million in that one maturity, and possibly one or two more um, prior to it. So, I mean, you would have you would have plenty to pay down if, if you're in that position. Okay. Thank you. So, Brian, of the, uh, what is the total amount of bonds that we have purchased to date? So you, you financed 80400000 and the, the principal amount, if you recall, ended up closer to seventy two. Right. And that was just because of that bid premium that we discussed. Then investors paid you more interest. For, for in exchange for a higher rate to hold, you took that eight, that eight million and paid down principal with it. So you so what's on your issued and outstanding on your audit is seventy two million, um, and then so this would be the final ten million out of the ninety million four hundred thousand. Okay, and of that seventy two million, is there any balance being kept somewhere of? How much of that's allocated to the middle school? How much is to the stadium and the auditorium? And how much is to the high school overall? Yes. yes. Okay. And that's not, obviously, we're spending most of it first at the middle school compared to the high school. We've yeah. already, I, I don't recall anything. exactly how we did it, but I think we, because we knew you were doing the middle school first. I right. We, yeah, we allocated this, this last issue would be more related to the, to the high school project, the largest of the three. Sure, but I mean, is getting back to Rob's question about the uh, interest that's being earned by those bonds that that were sold earlier. So, is there is the middle school, you know, making money on that interest, or is it mm -hmm. like right? There's there's about I, off the top of my head, there is there would be 
probably somewhere in the neighborhood of forty thousand dollars allocated interest allocated to the middle school project. It's very small compared to that. You were talking eight hundred fifty thousand to a yes. million that will be earned yep. on that yep. first eighty million, right? Yep. yep. So, all right, but this uh, ten million um, is kind of again going back to Sandy's question is just being able to be safer than sorry as far as how much maybe we don't even have to touch that capital fund at all and we still have savings over and above but we could use it to pay down debt I'm just wondering you know why don't we just commit to 9.5 million instead of the 10 and um, you know indicate we're already a half million under what the budget was just by the cost savings we've seen so far that that's absolutely an option <coughs> Okay. Mr. President? Yes. It sounds like uh, it might make sense for us during a work session to just talk through what principle we might have interest in borrowing, what our options are, just based on the conversation. Sure. The, tonight, yeah, we're not taking any votes tonight. This was just kind of information because of the timing with the interest rates and everything. So the next time we could consider this is May 30th. So just to, I just want to clarify, if if we don't um, select how to proceed, so at the May 30th, we won't be able to bring back for action the locked-in rates, so we'd be in June or at your next board meeting. Um, Could you bring back alternatives, like not not at, Not locked in, I can't, because we have to sell, we have to set up what we're selling to the investor. So if it's going to be nine and a half million, I have to be able to say we're selling nine and a half million. Or, or 10 million. What um, lead time do you need, Brian? Tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there's the, the next steps on the paperwork is going to Moody's for the final explanation of what the, the repayment plan is and having them assign their credit rating, get that out into to the uh, market and, you know, pre-May uh, 30th. I, I think we could do it with, it with another week, but, you know, I think your next regular meeting is the work session, I think. I, I don't, Mr. President. Yes, Bruce. I guess I, I don't see what the concern would be. One, the, the rates are what they are. The $10 million is what we had told the community. The opportunities that we have are, are numerous, right, of which one is to pay down debt early, right? So we're not paying the interest on that principal? Correct. I'm not sure that I see the downside of having him come back prepared for Ten million dollars. I mean, if it's nine million dollars versus ten, wouldn't you take that extra million and pay the debt down? I mean, you're still paying the debt down, so you're you're still providing benefit back to to the community. It's not as though we're trying to take this extra cash and do something different with it. Yeah, Mr. President, Rob, and I I agree with you, Bruce. You know, I think though just given some of the conversation from a, a board perspective, you know, there are some of us that are thinking maybe something different. And I think to, uh, to have that conversation, even if we have to have a short work session over the next week or something, so Brian has the time he needs, just so that we as a group are comfortable, um, might be a, a good path. I mean, I defer to the rest of the board. If everybody's in agreement, then let's go. But. Mr. President? Yes, Sandy. I have no problem with doing the whole $10 million. It, what, whatever is left is going back to pay down the debt. So with the explanation you and Tim have given us, I have no problem with doing the whole $10 million. Um, I would have a problem with taking much of this money and using it on something else, which you're saying we can't do, but you're saying we can do it in the middle school if we decide we need to do remodeling of something else in the middle school, we could use it for that. I don't think that's what the public thought we were going to do with the money is remodel other sections of the middle school. And that's but not that's what I was that's not what I was proposing. I was just saying that I that's wanted to make sure that's a possibility. I didn't want you to tell it's not a possibility. And that's and then, a conversation yeah. Yeah. at the time we're gonna spend the money. Yeah. We're totally. gonna spend it. But for right now, I don't think you can wait. If we can get this money at two percent, I think or is that what you said? Two two two, two somewhere in that quarter, range. Right. Some, mm -hmm. somewhere I think you need to do it before it goes up because I really I'm surprised interest rates haven't gone up with everything that's going on in the stock market. I'm surprised they have not gone up. Because once, once you're not uh, tonight because there's not an action, he just needs a general direction. Right. So, I mean, you can come back on the 30th and vote no 
I mean, all you know, and we don't sell anything, you know. So this is just he needs general direction on paperwork to get it to get it rolling. And I think, as you said, you know, we could sell even we can even sell the bonds, and we can take a couple months to decide. Okay, what is the appropriate next steps, and um, you know, and and kind of work through work through that process. So we can have them just like we sold eighty million dollars worth of bonds a year ago. <laughs> the majority of them are still sitting in our account. So it's it's not as though he sells this on on the you know 30th or whenever it is that you know week after that or however it's executed that all of a sudden you know you guys have to know by the end of the 30th how exactly you want it spent and we're going to spend it by end of may i mean this last 10 million might be the 10 million you know the majority of it might be not for a whole nother year because of the high school project and you don't have time to um somebody uh, Jamie mentioned nine and a half million. If you're, if we're going to do that, you need to know that because you've got a whole bunch of stuff to yeah. do before May 30th yeah. before you come back here. I, I can potentially offer a compromise. I can potentially offer a compromise to that to what we're talking about here. So if you recall, last year we did a parameter resolution and then sold the bonds shortly thereafter. So we could have on the 30th the discussion with the parameters not to exceed 10 million dollars. You could have the discussion that it sounds like you're talking about and then tell me let's go and then you know w within these rate parameters uh president and clerk the new new president or well, same, same president and clerk um <laughs> can sign off you know on the 31st or the first or you know shortly thereafter so if if you feel that you need to have that additional discussion you know we can set it up to where we execute it that next day or you know, later that week. Um, so uh, I'm trying to give you some options to work with. Sure. I, I understand about, you know, always being safe and, you know, we can always use it. But I just want to know, what's the cost? So the cost of the taxpayers the same if we take out $10 million or whether we take out 9.5. There's no extra cost to the taxpayer to do that. The, there will be some marginal costs on that 500000 for issuing. Right. You know, there's some, some variable costs based on the amount you borrow. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then if there's time, you know, let's say it's a year before you decide how to pay it down, you've carried the interest costs on that half a million for that year. Exactly. Right? That's so, what I'm... So, right. So, yes, there would be... I mean, to me, it's you, like taking out a mortgage two years in advance before a year and a half in this case before you actually need it for the construction and taking out more than you know you're going to need in order to, because it's a great interest rate, so let's just pay this lower interest rate on more money than we need. I just think if we do the 9.5, we, we save that it, right. carrying cost, we save some of that upfront uh, cost. Plus, I like the idea that instead of 90.4 million in bonds, which I understand the taxpayers said we could spend up to that, didn't spend, say we had to take that many money out, and then we come in under 90 million. Mr. President? Yes. So I think that um, logic, yes, makes sense. That said, we've got a lot of buildings and a lot of expenses that are coming up, and uh, we know those expenses are out there. It's not as though that they're not going to hit us. We have a fund balance that we don't have to use and tap into, and we can use so we don't have to pass that along to taxpayers in the future. To get money at this rate is pretty exceptional. And if you make it 90.4 or 89.9, it's really negligible in my opinion. I think the um, important part is that we're making sound fiscal decisions with the money that we do have. Uh, and those decisions all need to be put in front of the board before anything is made. So, you know, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to get the $10 million, have that guidance, roll forward with that, um, and we've, then we've got options with what we need to do with that money later. I, I think to dabble with, uh, you know, a, f a couple hundred thousand or whatever it might be at the end, um, you know, we'll be able to use that money to pay down the debt or not have to use the fund balance or um, make sure that we're keeping the rest of our uh, facilities up to date. Mr. Mr. President. President. Yes. Uh, I guess I'd like to Rob. suggest that uh, we take Brian's suggestion and give him the direction of $10 million not to exceed 
and then we can come back, have a discussion amongst ourselves, and then decide if we do 9.5 or 10 million, but for the sake of time, we can give him the direction of going after the 10 million not to exceed. Okay, so? Uh, yeah, Mr. President, um, I'm totally behind exactly what Bruce said, and the known factor here is that the 10 million has been approved by whatever it was, 57% of our community and so on. And I, I think I'd feel more comfortable staying on the known path here. Than, and I think all the arguments in behalf of how we can use that money if we don't put it into the buildings um, make sense for me. And, I'm real, uh, and I, the rates are incredible. And we're at a juncture here that I think would, we should take advantage of it. You're here tonight. You gave a very thorough explanation. Um, I'm ready to tonight to say let's continue with our plan and support the $10 million as the next bond. Okay. Any, uh, anyone else want to weigh in on this? Otherwise, I think, you know, we're not taking a vote tonight, but I think you got your direction of in the range. <laughs> Million not to exceed. Yeah. All right. So, okay. Well, again, what's what's the? Uh, if anyone else has weighed in, I think Heather and Carrie. I haven't heard from you. So far, we've got a couple people who would like to see up to ten million, and a couple that just want to say ten million regardless. So. I think it's hard to answer that question, not having consensus on the board about whether how open we are to using money to do other things that weren't part of the plan we presented. I think if the thought of the board was that, yes, we're open to that, then borrowing cheap money and using it to do work that we need to do anyway makes a lot of sense to me. If we're not going to go that direction, then the carrying cost of that, to me, is a real cost. And so if we are pretty darn certain we're going to come in a half million or a million under, then to me it doesn't make sense to borrow that money. But Perhaps that's the conversation that Rob is suggesting that we need to tee up in a little more detail is getting some consensus around are we on board with, heck yeah, let's grab this money at 2% because we've got a whole lot of projects that that would be wise to spend it on or not. Mr. President? Yes, Sandy. We can't spend the money on a whole lot of other projects, can we? It can only be spent on the referendum projects, nothing more. Correct. So it isn't a matter of getting the $10 million and then sending 500,000 out here and a million out there to do something else that we decide we're going to do. It has to be spent the way we said in the referendum. Correct? Okay. Cor correct. I think the, the variable is the, is the, the, is the, the fund balance. The fund balance. So that's, yeah. the three and a half million in fund balance, Got that. you could decommit and spend on any other project. So uh, what I'm hearing people say is not to exceed 10 million. And at that 30th meeting, you could make a determination if it's going to be 9.5 or if it's going to be 9 million or or if it's going to be the full 10, but that way you don't have to uh, come to an actual number and vote on it tonight, but we'll actually do it at the 30th. If that gets us to move forward, I support that. Okay. Agreed. I think we're beating a dead horse. I'd like to finance up to 10 million. If we can decommit up to 3.5, we do that. Okay. All right. Is that enough, Brian, for you now? Up, up to 10 million, you, Brian. Tim, do you feel like you know what we're asking Tom for drafting for the 30th? Um, I think I think probably the the one other piece that we uh, want to get feedback on is the is the three options that were presented. Um, and as Brian says, I think you know we're leaning toward we're really leaning towards that uh, third option. Um, so looking at the 10 million and the three. So if it's up up to the 10 in this example. Um, how that example is laid out gives you uh, the most interest cost savings and allows you flexibility uh, for the future. So that would be the other the other piece to this is is making sure that we give Brian enough direction so that when he does come back, he can um, he can say this is what this is what you have, what you wanted. Um, so again, looking at that uh, third option. By third option, you mean that's using the promissory notes refunding bonds with no balloon payment in, in 20 Co years. Correct. That's or, right. Or, yeah. Yeah. I, is anybody hankering for the other two options? I think that that's the one that saves the taxpayers there the most dollars. Agreed. So. Okay. Option three, proceed with that. Right. Okay. Thank you. I, I think I think we know what to have Tom draft for that meeting, right. and then 
we would lock in probably within a couple of days after that, assuming rates meet the parameters. So yeah, okay. making sure the board's comfortable, we'll bring it back, and that would be the so that would be the game plan going forward. Okay, agreed. All right. One last question: Do we pay anything more for saying up to ten percent? We don't get a lesser rate, or no, it could, yeah. because what what you're approving in that resolution, well, you're what you're getting is the discussion, the the formal additional discussion that night to say this is what we collectively agree. We we want it to be nine and a half, or we want it to be ten, or we want it to be nine. That then gives us direction of what to finalize. The resolution is going to be not to exceed ten million that the draft you're going to get in your packet will say not to exceed 10 million and it'll say as long as the rate is under x you know right. and and you borrow no more than 10 you're you're delegating the final sign off to the president and clerk very similar to what you did last summer so um it's that that's why so tim and i can still do some of the the rating discussions and get you prepared knowing that we're somewhere in that ballpark with that 10-year structure we can then finalize within, like I said, a few days to a week short, shortly thereafter. So that, does that answer your question, Bruce? Yes. All right. Anyone else? Otherwise, I think you have your direction. Thanks a lot, Brian, for your All right. time. Thank Thanks, you. Have Brian. a good evening. Thank you. Safe travels. Moving on to topics for action. Is there a motion to approve consent items with the, the language? Does somebody have the? Uh, I have the language. All right. I move approval of the consent items and the director of financial services be authorized to pay bills in the amount of four million two hundred and fifty five thousand two hundred and ninety three dollars and sixty six cents. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Bruce beat you, Rob. All right. Hmm. Motion by Sandy, second by Bruce. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The consent agenda items are approved. Then next up, select delegate to the CISA eleven annual convention. <clears throat> Don't everybody jump at this? Well, I'm happy to do it again if nobody else wants it. <laughs> oh, this one actually Bruce did last year, I think. Because this said Turtle Lake. This was in Turtle oh, Lake. I did this one, yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, so I maybe Bru maybe recommend. for continuity of, of of government, maybe it'd be good to to have to do it again. Second. <laughs> Third. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Pretty sure I'm traveling that <laughs> night. <laughs> Yeah, this is the one Bruce did, so he'd be able to explain what it is. Bruce, why don't you explain what it is? Uh, I mean, honestly, they had gone over a, a number of resolutions that seemingly already were kind of set, and it was just more of a formality. Yeah, formality and uh, process. But you know, you did get to meet a number of other board members from neighboring districts, um, learn a little bit about uh, some of those policies and and then uh, come home way to sell it bruce yeah. uh, it's working <laughs> right. it hard so Bro rob wanted to do it i mean he was ready to i do second uh, i nominate I rob i can't make a motion i <laughs> nominate rob <laughs> unless heather you're interested no, I, was, I, I would second that nomination. okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was going to say heather you know typically we've given that job to the newest member on the board <laughs> but if you want to take a pass for one year or who's ever happened? Very good. <laughs> what is June 5th? It's uh, Monday night. All right. So it's the week before, uh, I guess, our meeting for, for June. All right. Uh, here, anyone else? Otherwise, all those in favor of uh, electing Rob as the representative, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Rob? That's Nay. two elections you've won tonight. <laughs> so congratulations. I'm buying a lottery ticket. All right. Um, 2017-18 board um, schedule. Um, the uh, see, I read this over the weekend, and now I want to see if there's been any more changes. I see that. Uh, all right, we had some general discussion at our work session last time, and uh, I thought that the consensus was moving towards um, bifurcated t start times for a work session and the regular board meeting, so that. Um, community members could hit the regular board meeting at six o'clock. Maybe I misheard that, but um, I think you know it's just a matter of uh, picking the time. And I think that the five thirty, five thirty was there at our work session. But tonight would be the time when we set a motion. As far as the dates themselves, you could see 
We kept it pretty solidly on Monday. There are no Monday night conflicts with uh, Packer football, at least. I didn't check the Viking or the Bear schedule. But um, the question is, uh, do we start them both at 5.30 um, or do we go to 5.30 for the work session and 6? Since work sessions have generally been longer than the action meetings and we're trying to get family members who are coming home feeding their kids and sometimes trying to get to the board meeting, having them at 5.30, I think we're trying it makes it look like we're trying to limit the public's access to our meetings, but. Mr. President? Yes. I think, I think you're right about that. 5.30 is a hard time for people to get here. They're feeding their kids supper at that time. Nobody gets home from work till five o'clock and then they're feeding supper. And um, for 5.30, that's a time when most people will not be able to attend. Now, the exception, of course, would be on the night of the annual meeting. We always meet that one. That would be the one time we'd meet at 5.30, but. Is there any other um, comments? Otherwise, I take a motion to approve the. Um, you could also do calendar. both of them at both of them at six thirty. I just think whatever you do, you should be consistent in your time. So if you want to do them both at six thirty or both I at would, six, I would I, say both at six. Then if we're going to be consistent in our time, I, I just trying to remember which which night and which time, and the public, you know, trying to decide which which time they start. Yeah. And again, the push up, you know, that was something I suggested to the 530 it was just because you know we do get into some longer meetings and we kind of hit that nine o'clock threshold and yeah that's a that's a tough spot for people yes, it is but not in an effort to to eliminate public I input um but just uh just an effort to to keep people fresher longer but uh 6 is fine too i just i just really think some people have expressed concerns with trying to remember is this a 6 30 night or a six o'clock night well, who's expressing those? I haven't heard any board members express that. I've had board members call me. I'm not going to mention their names, and I've. Okay. Uh, all right. Bruce. <laughs> not. It's all in my calendar. It's what I live by. Yes. I'm still googling bifurcated, but I would be fine with <laughs> having <laughs> two start times. But I w but I love the 5:30 start time for the work session. And bifurcated. Yeah. And bifurcated. So maybe for a regular meeting, you could have them later. So. The I don't know. What are your thoughts? All right. Uh, Mr. President? Yes. The work sessions are usually not attended by the public. Rare to have any public here. We can all be here by 5.30 for a work session night. We grab something quick on the way out the door and eat on your car on the way Actually, over Actually, we, we would have dinner for those nights for the 5.30. Oh, that's what we talked about. The Board about. of Education meeting do at 5.30? Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. No, that's, that's <laughs> what no, we I'm had kidding, said. I'm kidding. Yeah. No, no that's what um, we had said. I think the board session, the work session being at 5.30 is fine. They get long, mm -hmm. and we could still be out of here by 9 or 9.30 before we get a fried brain. And, but I honestly believe the, the Board of Education meetings at 5.30 is too early for the public. Okay. They are not going to be able to get home, get their kids fed, and get here. They're just going to skip it if they have to be here. Even if they have to be here at 6.00. They're going to skip it. That's early for them. I think six is maybe reasonable. I well, you think about the people coming <coughs> from the cities, and they have to come home in that traffic. They're not getting home till five or five thirty. Yeah, but if it's something that they're really interested in being at, I'm sure they would figure out a way to be at that meeting on time. People make it to their kids' six o'clock ball games. Often. Yeah, that has. <laughs> you know, and and by it's a little different. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I think we. <coughs> We could look at the agenda and see when we have uh, um, have a cutoff time for people to get their comments in. Mm -hmm. You know, we could we could explore that as well. But I, I do like the concept of meeting earlier. <coughs> um, the June twelfth is the Al Hein Golf mm -hmm. Charity event. And, you know, any of one participating in that would need to be blasting out of there early as well. All right. Yeah. So, is there a motion? Move to approve the schedule with the uh, uh, regular Board of Education meeting starting at 6 and the work sessions at 5.30. Second. All right. There's been a motion, a second. Any further uh, comment uh, or question? Question, Hearing, question yes. of clarification, because there's a few days on that calendar that already happened. So, is this effective immediately? <laughs> Great question. I think, yeah, our superintendent has jumped in there and amended the document. So um, other than, uh, well, you're good. Yeah. yeah, tonight's meeting, obviously, um, 
has started when it started, but um, for all meetings moving forward, these would be the start times. And uh, that's a good question is we, pending some further action for, for next year, we've, we've gone out as far as Monday, June 25th. If we try this and we want to move that date, um, we always make this calendar, um, you know, we set the calendar that first meeting in May. So that, that could be subject to change. Otherwise, we're not, and we have. We've been known to do that during the year. We've changed meeting start times to reflect uh, local schedules and whatnot. But this is going to be what, moving forward what we want to try for the year moving forward. But good clarification. Anyone else? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right, now next up is the policy 200. We had our first reading at the work session. This is still technically the first reading. So we really have two first readings and two second readings before they're passed. Hmm. Yes, pretty much. And as you said, we discussed it at the board work session. I'm certainly willing to walk <coughs> through it in great detail um, if you guys would so desire. Otherwise, I think the policy review cycle document um, provides an overall summary to um, the different policies in the 200 series, and it primarily just pertains to administration. Everything from the posting recruitment, retention, or recruitment and employment of the superintendent, district organization, board, administer, board administrator relations, and then evaluations and um, job descriptions. So if you'd like me to go into more detail, I can, or if there's any questions, I'm happy to entertain them as well. Well, there was one, um, I, I, Nick, are you controlling them? No, oh, I'm not. Who, okay, so that, that Tim Miner. All right, he's pulled up that. <laughs> you happen to be reading my mind because this was the one that I wanted to uh, pull up. It's probably the most helpful. I mean, people certainly can do their reading, and I've browsed through the different uh, policies, some of which were recently adopted and we're just continuing them, so there's no right. major changes. Right. Others are having major changes, and then others are just tweaks where we talk about chief financial officer and chief executive officer. So, um, but this is the one that I think is really helpful because it shows how the policy relates. Um, why don't you explain that just a little bit? The Andrew. chart here? Yes. Um, so then, yeah, it has our, the policy number, the policy title, the and the subsection, which is actually gonna be the policy number subsection. Um, and it really ha is descriptive. And then if you click on it, you can link it directly to the policy that we're proposing to be updated. And then if you go further to the right, oops, okay. If you go further to the right, you can see that it has the most recent review, revision, the WASB um, recommendation, and then the process comments, and then the continuation of that. So this is the document that I'm using as my working document for all the series. Um, but then you can see as I'm completing the different drafts, I'm putting that in the process comments. And once this is um, completed through the first and second reading, then you'll see up above how I turn the 100 series yellow that would be um, what we would do with the 200 series. And then going forward on the uh, five-year basis, we'll be reviewing these um, and continuing to update the spreadsheet. So again, I think this is the working document that I'm trying to base off. Okay, of. and so this WASB review recommendation, so there's one says recommended, other says important. Yes. It doesn't mean the ones that say recommended aren't important, it just means that it's really, it's it was more highly recommended that you use their language well, and Scott those important. were existing ones. And so I just kind of came up with those categories. The recommended was recommended new. Everything in blue is new. Um, the purple, I know there's lots of colors, but the purple are uh, the ones that they're re recommending revisions. And you can see a lot of them are from 1990. Well, even the 2014, the superintendent evaluation one, um, just recommends us reviewing it. So that's why I color coded it as um, important and put them in purple. The orange shade kind of tan color are deletions recommended deletions primarily because of repetitiveness um, when we did do the renumbering project this section was really affected because um, cutting and pasting it in different areas once we started creating new policies in 100 it kind of made some of them irrelevant and so that's where you have a few of the deletions there but it's a, it's an important document it was kind of hidden behind that review cycle which was showing when we're reviewing certain 100 oh, series. The first tab um, of the worksheet, yeah. Board members are just directed to click on that second tab that says policy <coughs> details at the bottom. And, and I think that that's a good place, a good starting place for yes. everybody in reviewing these to give you, get your bearings where it fits in 
and wait till the 800 series. It's a big series that we'll be covering in a couple months. Okay. Mr. President, I just have one question for yes. Andrea. Um, so um, it's the superintendent um, in conjunction with the president of the board that sets the agenda for the Board of Education meetings. Yes. Thank you. In, in the 100 series, I believe it lays out that, yep. Okay, so this is 200 is shorter than, relatively shorter than the 100 series was. Yes, it is. But um, with this, now, it, this is under action items, and so we're kind of approving the first reading, but we're not, that doesn't mean that it's, we're um, formally adopting the policy. It just right. means we're approving the first reading. The first reading, and then if there are subsequent questions that if you want to talk into the work session again, we can certainly do that uh, before, before it's brought back to <coughs> for the final second reading. And then it's adopted, and then it'll be reflected on the website once it's finally adopted. And so if somebody were to have a question after we approve the first reading, that doesn't preclude us from changing a policy or punctuation. No. I'm excited about this series from the perspective of I think it gives us a good um, framework that we can work as an administrative team um, right. on some of the hiring processes as well as in particular 253.1, 2, and 3 about the handbooks and um, the student handbooks, administrative rules, and then uh, the staff handbooks. And what I'm most concerned with is how this 200 series, which deals with administration, fits with our 100 series, which is board, po board operations. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to see us uh, philosophically opposing right. um, you know, ourselves on any particular policy uh, when it comes to how we're governing. I, and I think that's why using a consistent basis, basis which is the WSB recommendation, and kind of using that as a the framework by which we're building all of our policies makes it consistent. Um, and so that we have that uh, versus, you know, um, NEOLA, there's a lot of different places that have their versions of the policies. And it's, they're very diff di divergent in their approaches. And so by using the WASB version consistently, I think that will embed consistency from top to bottom. That's the goal. All right. Mr. President, yes. um, should so I make the motion? Sure. Okay. I move that uh, we uh, approve the first reading of uh, policy series 200. Is there a second? Second. All right. Second by Rob. Motion by Sue. Any other questions, comments? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's approved. Next up is commercial insurance proposals, and I'm assuming Tim or no. is it Mark? Who's uh, well, both, both of us will do this. Um, so we had a we had a good turnout. Uh, we had six different proposals for commercial insurance. So the insurance covers our liability package, our property insurance, and then our workers' comp insurance. And so we spent a lot of time analyzing. Um, we work with a with a our uh, RMS risk management services who has an insurance background, a person does not sell insurance, but she has a lot of knowledge to kind of help wade us through. What you're seeing here is highly summarized. And so um, it, was, it was good in the way that we, we had a lot of competition. Um, one of the things that we asked for in this was we wanted to have the ability to use our own law firm um, through the insurance process. So uh, many times insurance companies have their own legal experts depending on what area it is that they're dealing with. And so um, a few of those companies did say um, they didn't commit to say, yes, you can use your own law firm. Some of them said we could see that there are certain areas where we would, we'd, we'd, we would consider using your law firm. So uh, that's one of the things that we did, and that's under the liability portion of the policy. Um, so <coughs> CIC is our current carrier, and you can see how they, how they uh, stack up. So one of the things when we looked at that request to use our own law firm, um, we ran into different answers with these different companies. So CIC uh, provide, probably provides the most coverage um, and, the, and the best coverage for the liability package. However, their, their uh, stance and their position is we, we have a group of attorneys that we work for for different issues. So um, that's the way that they're going to go and we're not gonna allow you to use your, your own law firm. Um, their coverage includes five million dollars non-aggregate coverage. So every time that every time you had a claim, uh, you'd be eligible for a claim that would cover up to five million dollars. 
the next claim that comes, it would reset that amount. So each time within that year of coverage, it would reset that. So that's why that coverage is, is, is pretty strong. Um, the, probably the, the next best coverage uh, would be EMC Spectrum Insurance under the liability. Uh, they've got a $2 million, $4 million, so it's $2 million per occurrence, $4 million in aggregate for the year. But then also we, we have umbrella coverage. We always request umbrella coverage under these, so uh, that gives us additional protection. So in their umbrella coverage case, it's $6 million per occurrence and $12 million in aggregate for the year. So again, uh, you know, we haven't seen any claims like that. It's, we can't say we'd never have a claim that would run that high, but that would be a, that would be a very catastrophic claim uh, when they get up into the $12 million, six to $12 million uh, range. So uh, Spectrum did say that um, they would consider using our law firm, um, provide, and they also provided fairly good coverage and uh, the price is comparable to what CIC uh, provides. So. That's why you see the two yellows there. Um, it's kind of a wane of the of the two different things: the the uh, richer coverage that CAC provides versus being able to uh, really consolidate and simplify things if we have a an issue uh, under the liability package. Uh, the property package, the next piece. Um, again, the different proposals are laid out there. Uh, we would recommend going with Chubb for the property insurance. Um, we currently have them, and they came in. Uh, came in pretty competitive. Uh, reason that we wouldn't look at um, WRM and, uh, and uh, let's see, would it be Heartland, I believe, uh, is their coverage is lacking in, in several different areas. So that's why we would recommend uh, going with Chubb um, at this point. Uh, when we look at workers' comp, workers' comp is highly regulated by the state. The premiums that uh, companies charge are highly regulated. You can see that that workers' comp premium across the board is is very similar, um, and that's because of the everybody has to charge the same. The area that we have the most uh, potential to differentiate between those carriers is really the dividend that they provide, and the dividend is not a guarantee, uh, but it is approved by the by the insurance company's board of directors. Um, we, haven't, we haven't seen a case yet where they've come back and said, you know, we told you you'd get a 30% dividend, we're cutting it back to 20. We just, we just haven't seen that. Um, so we feel relatively certain we can put that down as savings. So when we look at um, Hastings Company, which is the blue, the one shaded in blue, uh, they're providing a 50% dividend and that, uh, I don't think I've ever seen one that high. Uh, that's very possibly it's to, to help get us in the door. And, but again, it's workers' comp, it's pretty generic coverage across. And uh, you know, we're we're kind of saying, why wouldn't we do that? Um, the, the coverage is the same, same. It's not like the not like the property insurance where there are there are some very big differences between the companies. So the net uh, workers' comp cost winds up to be one fifty three. Uh, versus our current, and you can see all the way on the left in the white, it's 227, about 228 now. So if you look at the recommendation tonight, it would be uh, going with uh, EMC Spectrum Insurance, and that would be the liability, going with uh, Chubb for the property package, and then going with Hastings uh, for the workers' comp. So that recommendation is about 295000 so uh, represents a savings of about 70, just under $70,000 over what we're paying this year. So uh, we'll take questions if you, if you have any. Mr. President. Yes, Bruce. Um, so is it just one new provider or are we working with the others right now or would this be a wholesale change? Currently we've got, we have CIC for the, <clears throat> for the liability portion. And we have the Chubb, which is which would remain as part of a recommendation, and then we'd be changing uh, from RAS, um, which we currently have for workers' comp. We'd be changing to the Hastings Group for the workers' and, comp. Okay, and you're comfortable you're comfortable with the change? I mean, do we have any? Do they provide any like um, references to call or anything like that? Are you? We've we've talked to our uh, the the consultant that we work with on this, and she you know she just doesn't have any good references. They're fairly it's a fairly new they're fairly new to the market to the Wisconsin market, um, and 
you know, as we went through that, we said, you know, I'm not sure there's really a big downside to this because it is, again, they're, they're pretty highly regulated when you come to workers' comp. Yeah. They have to provide certain coverages. Um, there's value-added services that could come into play as well. But uh, we thought, again, um, without with kind of with a lack of uh, not many people using them, it's, you know, we really looked at the savings there, and it's, it's and then, pretty significant. Thank you. And then we're, uh, did we have more bidders than this, or is this? Kind of the comprehensive final five that you. This would be the comprehensive. We don't have any more of that, right? Now. Okay. Oh right. yeah. Okay. Or six there. Yeah. Right. All right. Nice work. All right. Looks good. I have. I understand the liability. The differences in coverages available. Whether you have to go into an umbrella, because then when you do that, you're dealing with a different policy than the primary liability policy and so forth. So I can understand the recommendation on the liability and with work comp. Obviously, um, getting a bigger dividend is, is nice. You're generally going to have same or very similar types of coverage, so those two. But how did you differentiate on the property and uh, go with a $91,000 premium versus uh, or estimate versus one that was 69 or 76? Because the deductibles yeah. are the same. So with... With, uh, I, I believe it was WRM, Mark, if we're looking at stated limits of property, if you, I don't know if you recall, um, WRM had, um, when we insure buildings, we want to go with stated values, um, and they're, they did not provide, they will not provide coverage for stated values, so it leaves a big gap in our coverage. So that was the difference with WRM. Um, Liberty, recall. In, in a lot of these two, um, and... As Tim kind of alluded, this is very summarized at this level. Um, if, just to give you an idea, the property alone, there was probably 70 different areas of coverage in that line yep. that we went through, um, and everyone varied by carrier. So we tried to look at it comprehensively and which one you know, had the best package, and that's kind of where we landed on Chubb, had overall better coverage in a lot of different areas. There wasn't really one specific one that we said this is the most important, and here's why. Um, it was just kind of looking at the thing collectively, and that's what got us to that. Okay, I, we I figured it was, it was one of those things because I know yeah. that there could be 70 different, I mean, you, you're talking about equipment coverage. Correct. Theft, mm -hmm. vandalism can vary, and so trying to take 70 variables and um, even Correct. those out and try to figure out where the value is. you got to look at where your claims come in, and all it takes is one really large claim to make up that difference in premium yeah. um, if you have fa the most better favorable coverage i i'm, I'm somebody who yep. tends to want to lean that way because you don't want to have an instance happening and you tried to save yourself a dime in a, in a premium and then end up not being covered for a huge loss any other questions on these recommendations is there a motion i move to accept the insurance that uh their rec uh, administration is recommending we take basically Second. the trifurcated um Trifurcated. Yes. <laughs> He's really working it now. Yeah. Okay. Second. All right. Motion by Sandy. Second by Bruce. Uh, according to the recommendations, it would be CIC. Uh, it would be EMC. EMC yes. for liability, right. Chubb for property, and Hastings for work comp. Everyone yes. understand that? Okay. Yes. Uh, can I ask for clarification? Yes. So you think it's more important to have the umbrella coverage than up to $5 million that doesn't we don't get penalized if we have six, six o of those. O overall, the better the better coverage, the richer coverage would be with CIC. But again, you kind of you kind of weigh um, is EMC's coverage adequate? Do we think it's adequate? And that's kind of where we floated to. And then uh, with the with the added thing that EMC is saying they would consider um, in whatever the, depending on the circumstance they consider using our law firm, which greatly simplifies things uh, we, we've gone through the thing where we've had two different we've had the insurance company law firm we've had our law firm and you know it, it's it's very messy it's nice um, to have that so. flexibility and yeah. Yeah. when they use our law firm are they paying their rate because insurance companies pay lower rates than what yeah yeah we the yeah they uh, yeah our firm has provided rates uh, to the insurers as a discounted rate but we're not to we're not going to be on the hook for paying the difference no they no they would no they yeah our firm pro provides that discounted rate to the insurance company as well so okay so that's yeah, ex excellent point of clarification Carrie all right because we we will spend 
easily, the, you know, the difference on having to pay our attorney to talk to their attorney and go back and forth because we have two different, I don't want to say conflicting pieces of legal advice, but sometimes not totally in sync with each other. So the ability to use our own attorneys for the majority of our, our insurance work is a huge, huge plus for us. Well, right. I agree. Anything else? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. And last, we have the health and dental insurance rates for 2017-18. All right, so again, <laughs> hopefully this is a quick one. This is good news as we looked at uh, looked at our claims um, going through the year here through uh, March March 31st. Um, we're tracking at our uh, what they call a loss ratio. If you look all the way to the right, that's tracking about 93%. So um, that's very very favorable. Um, if you're hitting 100%, you're exactly even. That would be perfect. Uh, if you're over 100%. That means you probably have a problem, uh, but you can see. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, you know, give you an example. We're looking at the claims section. You can see how that rolls rolls along. And March was a high year for us, so we hit uh, seven hundred seventy thousand dollars in total claims. And if you look in there, it, it in December was five hundred sixteen thousand. So um, it varies wildly, and that's another reason we have um, fund balance that. Uh, you as a board have designated for uh, for the health insurance. But this year, uh, long story short, is when we're looking at the, the claims, we're looking at our loss ratio, um, we think we would come in, we would recommend a 0% increase for 17, 18 school year for the health insurance. And then the dentals attached there as well on a second page. So you can see that too. And again, that one's that one's much simpler, much simpler, much more straightforward, and we're tracking at 80, about 83%. So um, that would mean we've had a year, we've, over the past uh, four years, we, had, we would have zero for 17, 18, we had zero for this year, we had 3% the year before that, and 5% the year prior to that. So we're tracking well into the single digits and then two years of zero, so. So when you you listen to these other districts talk, they're getting 20 and 30% rate increases in their insurance. And over the last eight years, we've only gone up 8% combined in eight years. So we're uh, I think we're managing it quite well. And, um, you know, again, our goal is to, um, we don't ever want to get into a point where we're in a, you know, an emergency situation is with funds, but we also don't want to just, you know, take funds and hold them, you know, for not, you know, we're not a bank. Our goal is to cover our rainy day, and that's about it. You know, we're, we don't have a profit margin we need to build into these things. So we're in a really good spot right now. Mr. President? Yes, Rob. So, Tim, is there any, any time, because we're at 83% plan funding to total fees and claims? That's, that's for, the, for the dental? Do you want to? No, so just for the dental. For but dental, if we're at 83% yeah. just for the dental, is there at any time where we would consider a reduction? You know, that's a good question. We've talked about that before is what do we do if we're, you know, more along the health insurance realm, what do we do if we're, we're tracking really low? Uh, normally, um, it's good to leave, you can, good to track at a zero rather than a decrease because uh, occasionally you jump back up to the averages and now you're trying to catch up from a year where you've gone down and you're, now you're pushing rates up uh, quite a bit. In the dental, um, you know, I would probably recommend that we, we, uh, go with the zero this year and then we can we can take a look at the potential to lower rates if we keep tracking that way how did we do last year do you know when we finish we close to 85 to 90 percent of, right. of premiums uh, yeah i think uh yeah we were probably closer to the the 90 i mean and you can see so august for example you see august 148 percent um, and then we track low, and then we've got March at a hundred, little over 101 percent. So we're trying to trying to balance that out. So we'll track it another year, and then discuss it. Year from yeah, we can. Then we could have that discussion about what what a rate reduction may look like. Just to explain a question I have on the uh, different months. There is that just when payments were made, or is that when the bills are incurred or the rec the bills generated? Yeah, the the paid claims section is 
pure paid claims. So it's not just a, it's not an incurred cost. It's actually claims that have been paid where we get in, we get informed by the health partners when those claims are paid. Okay. So for like the dental, that means people are running the dentist in July and uh, the, those get paid in August. And there, there's always gonna be a little bit of a delay of when they've incurred that cost versus when that claim is actually paid, when it has to run through kind of the processing at the insurance provider. Okay. So for us, this is reflecting when that's actually paid and they're pulling the money from our account. It's not necessarily when they, you know, it might not match up exactly when somebody visited a dentist or a health provider. And how is the fixed portion set of, of our premium? It's got fixed. In that, got that's what Delta, we're, so we're fully self-funded with Delta. Del, so Delta is the administrator of the plan. They, so that's they, just they, the, that's they just the fee for them. To yeah, do. that's a yeah, set fee. Yeah. Right. It, it, we still have a smaller fee we pay them to administer the plan. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I would, you know, caution before we, because I usually beat Tim and Mark up over trying to keep this at zero or one or two, is with rate reductions, one of the things that does happen is when we do bring in, like, let's say health insurance at the end of the year comes in at 90% of, of premium, you know, total cost, then that, that really means that there's 10% that we were budgeting for health insurance claims that we don't have to allocate to health insurance. So that helps offset, you know, other costs in the budget and things like that. And we start to get a pretty good idea what that looks like usually in what end of May, first part of June type of thing. So, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, probably wouldn't see rate reductions or a recommendation for rate reductions, but what you may see, uh, is some things. The other thing that we can do with those premiums, if we don't need to spend them on claims is that money could still be taken. The district could still allocate money to build up fund balance in the insurance fund. You know, because we, we want to get today. to 40% or... We don't do that today. Yeah, we have a we have insurance fund uh, yeah. balance close yeah. to, what, 30-some percent we, of claims? We've got, yeah, we're, we're uh, yeah, we've got about two million, roughly two million, just under $2 million. And we've, we started, that was the seed money to get started on the self-funding, and that, that gets us close to where we want to be, but we'd like to be at, uh, so if you look at the claims figure, we'd like to be at, purely from a claim standpoint at uh, 40 about 40 percent of claims so we could we could add some to that it would be helpful and it just sits there board approves that and it just sits there until we need to use it to you know in a bad year because you know we've been we've been uh, really fortunate you know at, at some point in time we'll be coming and saying hey we're, we're having a bad we're having a bad claims year and we need to probably dip into that fund use that fund balance that was that was the intent for it and then the rate increases then be reactionary towards, okay, we need to probably up the rates not only to account for potentially another year like that, but also then to potentially replenish some of that, uh, some of that fund balance that we had to use. And so, again, I think our big, our big gain is, is that we have our pool. I mean, we're not pooled with a bunch of other groups. Uh, it is, and then we have reinsurance at 110, or is it 115,000? Uh, we're, we're 110 or 115. I'm trying to remember. I think we're at 110. Yeah, so was, we don't pay oh, Mark says beyond that. I mean, after 110, another insurance company kicks in. So we do have some reinsurance there. So, But uh, Tim and Mark have done an outstanding job managing this for the district. It's been a big project, and uh, it has saved us considerable amounts of money. But even more so than that, it has allowed us to continue to attract and retain great people because uh, with our deductibles, it's they're almost unmatched anywhere else. 25500 and to know that the board is not having to go and just sink gobs and gobs of additional funds into this in order to maintain those deductibles, that helps as well. Well, yeah, I appreciate the work you guys put in because it's really good in these self-insured models to even out those peaks and valleys. And um, yeah, so is there a motion? I moved we accept the 0% uh, increase for health and dental for this coming year. All right, motion by Sandy, second by Heather. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. I'll now entertain a motion for us to go into closed session pursuant to the statutory language. Move to convene to closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 1985, Parent 1, Parent C, to consider the performance evaluation of administrative employees. Second. Motion by Bruce, second by Kerry. I roll calls for a roll call vote. Rob? Brown, aye. Whitaker, aye. Hanson, aye. Johnson, aye. Katasai. The aye. Loglin, aye. The motion passes. We are going into closed session. We should take about five minute recess.